I'm going live, sir. So in next 10 seconds, you can start, sir. Good evening. For the delegates who have joined in India and good morning for the delegates who have joined from USA. Uh, I welcome you to this uh, webinar on um, a, a, we are discussing about um, the future of the stone management, dusting with suction, a new dimension toward the complete stone clearance. In last 40 years, the stone management has undergone a paradigm shift. The development of the high energy to dust the stone and innovation in instrument to evacuate the stone with a suction, either in mini park or RIS, aiming for the total stone, aiming for the total stone clearance. aiming for the total stone uh, clearance. And uh, this we are going to discuss and to discuss its practical implication. Um, I have the pioneering urologist have joined us for this debate. I would like to introduce first my friend, Dr. Glenn Preminger. He is a professor of urological surgery in the chief uh, 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 of the division in, du in the Duke uh, University of Medical Center. He is the current president of the Endurology Society. He, is, um, uh, he has done many innovation um, in the stone management, especially in the flexible electroscopy. I had opportunity to learn a flexible electroscopy from him. And uh, he has published more than 350 manuscripts and written 100 book chapters and 10 books. And uh, he is going to done an a innovative idea in in incorporating suction with a flexible erotoscopy. So welcome, Glenn Preminger. Um, now, second is I would like to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Kushit Ghani, uh, again, a good friend. And um, he has a very interesting history. He is a graduate from the University of Leeds. And Ghani completed the basic surgical training in Edinburgh, followed by the urological surgery training in London. He was awarded Master of Surgery Thesis from the University of London for the research on a percutaneous renal stone surgery. Following completion of his subspecialty in training in endurology at the stone unit at Guy's Hospital, he went to USA. He was awarded Urological Foundation Scholarship and he was trained in robotic surgery at the Vedicity Urological Institute, Henry Ford Hospital, Detroit. And Dr. Ghani joined University of Michigan faculty in 2013 and leads the endurological program at Ann Arbor in the healthcare system. Um, he has authored over 130 peer-reviewed publications and he is the co-editor of the textbook of endurology, a practical handbook. He's he is the course director of the National Symposium on Erotroscopic Development in Erotroscopic Stone Treatment, what is known as the TUST. And that's a very interesting and very innovative um, uh, conference every year. In particular, Dr. Ghani has been focused on advancing the testing technique for the endoscopic stone surgery and has extra mural funding to study the homium laser lithotripsy. He has served as the director of the Michigan Neurological Surgery Improvement Improvement Collaborative a Music, which is a consortium over the 40 urological practices aiming to improve the quality of care of the patient with the prostate cancer, kidney stones, kidney cancer in the state of Michigan. So I welcome you, Dr. Krushit. Next one is Dr. Amy Krambeck. And uh, Amy has begun her career in 2009 as a professor of urology at Mayo Clinic. And in 2017, she joined Indian University of School of Medicine staff at the Michigan Ma Michael O'Cock Professor of Urology and IU Health as a practicing urologist. Amy has uh, a recipient of the Arthur Smith Award for the Excellence in Indurology. She has been done lots of pioneering and research work on tree logic, and we will be listening to her and her experience in, in the tree logic. Welcome. Dr. Amy. Now I welcome Mihir. 
Um, um, he is at the moment Professor of Clinical Urology and Vice Chair of the New Technology and Innovation, Director Center of the Advanced Robotic uh, USC. He has more than 250 publication to his name. Um, he has done uh, a, a, a novel, he devised a novel technique for the treating the erotropelvic obstruction that was known as a uh, endopyloplasty. Uh, uh, then he developed a novel flexible aerobotic platform for erotroscoping and then single port. Uh, uh, Mihir has received many national and international award, and one of them is Arthur Smith Award for the Excellence in Endurology. He's on the editorial board of Urology, is an invited reviewer to many of the national and international journals. Welcome, Mihir. Now, Dr. Ravinder Sabnis, he's the chairman and the head of the Urology department at uh, Mujibai Patel Urology Hospital, has a special interest in endurology and the kidney transplant, has conducted various PCNL courses across the globe has many prestigious posts like uh, treasurer, um, then council member in West Zone, council member in the Urological Society of India, honorary secretary of West Zone, president of West Zone, council member of board of education, chairman of the board of education of USI, honorary secretary of Urological Society of India. And he has many international and national publication to his credit. Welcome Sabnes. Dr. Chandra Mohan, he is a dynamic young man from Hyderabad, and he is um, um, innovating the uh, and training and teaching flexible erotroscopy. In, um, and recently, he is the first one to start a laser RIRS, uh, and especially he has been um, a pioneer in uh, working on a children. And he has the youngest child him, whom he has done a flexible erotroscopy. Kandramon, nice to have you with us. And then I would like to um, uh, introduce Abhijit Patil. He is our endological fellow um, uh, at uh, Nadiad. And other three persons, Shashank Agarwal, uh, Navin Kumar Reddy, and Darshit Shah, they are our fellow. Um, uh, in, they are our residents at the Hospital Hospital. So welcome all the faculty and welcome all the, um, uh, the participant. Um, well, we've been for many, many years, we've been um, um, uh, trying to, to um, clear the stone. And, and uh, for, for many years, um, uh, I, I must congratulate the, the, the industry for innovating the technology which is helping us. And today, what I see, the, I foresee as the future of stone management, two important aspects, the energy for disintegration and a total stone clearance at the same time. We have in 2019 a good development of an energy which polarizes a stone like shock pulse, trilogy, Moses laser by luminous, lattice is thulium. For a total stone clearance, there is an innovation development in suction, a powerful tube suction in shock pulse and trilogy, and in a nephroscope sheet suction in PCNL as well as a flexible urotroscopy. The stone is global and incidence is increasing. But the size is decreasing. It is a recurrent disease. It can destroy the kidney and associated with a high morbidity, if not mortality. No age is immune. No sex is immune. No race is immune. No region is immune. And it was Andrew Ponty who said, if you have a residual fragment more than two millimeter or even less than two millimeter, had to repeat the procedure rate of 30% and 33% respectively. This implies that even a small residual fragment, less than two millimeter, may have a significant consequences and that a zero fragment outcome has the most desirable result. We have so far done about 30,000 stone treatment in 42 years. And our experience is that even if you completely clear the stone, there is 17 percent patient will form a stone again in, um, in two to five years time. And if you're left the stone, a resource fragment, then again in three to five times, 72% will have a recurrence of the stone. We have incorporated all the energy as per our uh, uh, suitability uh, of, the, uh, of our hospital and the economical burden which it gives. 
What is remarkable in last few years, we have seen the stone size is decreasing. Now, maximum size, stone size is between one and two centimeters is 42% and two to three centimeters is 32%. That means almost 80% of the stone is less than three centimeters, which is um, which is possible to remove by a mini pork, but we need a energy. And today we have the energy. Stegon calculus has dropped to less than 14%. So the paradigm shift in, um, in the idea uh, uh, is that the, the two important aspect of energy stone disintegration, they store total stone clearance at the same time. We have the shock pulse, trilogy, Moses laser and thulium, which makes the stone disintegrated into a dust. If we can make a dust or a small fragment, and if we have a, we can suck it out, we can have the complete clearance there and then. We don't have to wait. And for sucking out, we have the tube suction, we have a PCNL sheet suction, ureteral sheet suction, super, super perk or CAVAC. And so we combination of these two is going to um, uh, make a difference. Almost seven to eight years ago, when the EMS came out with um, uh, a 20 watt laser with a long pulse, uh, we requested them to make a suction tube for us. And they made a 4.5 French device that was, this is the one which is seen, where, which is that's a handle, which you can, you can press and the suction will start, which will go through the 12 French uh, telescope. And you can pass a 365 micron fibers can go through that. And you can use it to disintegrate the stone. This is the stone. And here we have done the uh, uh, mini perk. And here you can see the stone and with the laser and the suction, um, we are disintegrating the stone. Of course, this is with the long pulse and the low power. But here we are fragmenting the stone and with the suction effect, the fragment would come out and we'll, uh, we'll collect it. So here you can see that the suction was used, but this, this was, and many other people, they, they also devised the suction, but that was for the standard mini perk. And this is for the, um, uh, a, a st standard PCNL. This is for a mini perk, and then um, then now we have the Olympus shock pulse, which can go through the mini perk. It is a powerful one. Trilogy is a powerful. The Moses uh, laser again is a high high watt laser, and recently the thulium, which has come. And along with them, uh, they have the tube, which is a suction, um, uh, which which is which can be arranged to adjust the suction power, you can suck out um, at the same time. And here is the um, uh, uh, clear patra. Here is a sheet, a plastic sheet with a suction. And you can, um, while you are putting a 12 French, you can, dust can be sucked out. And once you have a fragment coming out, you can withdraw your scope up to this red line and the fragment can suck out. So that can be used in Moses as a thulium. So here is an example where it, there's a stone, there's a standard stone. And here you can see that the old four energy are aiming to break the stone uh, into a dust. And this dust, which is, uh, you can see the dust, which is sucking out at the same time. Now here also, you are breaking the stone and at the same time into a small fragment, which sucks out without, without even um, um, uh, injuring anything. Uh, similarly, Trilogy also is the one which is um, uh, a, a, a powerful uh, tools where it not only breaks, but it sucks out and it is uh, into, a, into a small, small fragment. So this is the four energy, which is um, uh, using through the um, uh, mini perk, which can be uh, used to dust the stone. And the same time, yeah. so this is a, the animation which I have borrowed from the company, the idea is that um, the, the electromagnetic um, um, uh, uh, and impactor, both are used to break the stone and suck it out. So, so this is the, the one which is um, the handle is can go through the mini perk also. So here is a PCNL suction. Now here is the tube. And there is a hole here where you can put a finger. So whenever you want to increase the suction, you can put a finger and you can break the stone. It's a one-step procedure. Being a plastic, it is a less radiation hazard as well. And here 
For example, if you're using with the laser, the laser can be sucked out and you can put it into a tube and then the whole fragment can be, um, uh, to be collected. For example, here, just showing the dag diagrammatically, the stone fragments, they are second. We are making sure that every fragment is collected and then we will uh, analyze that. And then when we get the, the stone, we put a stone into sieve. And here, any stone which is more than three millimeter would be um, um, uh, sieved outside. And then it will come down. Here it is one to three millimeter. And then on the, on the powder is the dust less than one millimeter. So we know exactly. And then we can weigh them here and try to find out the, how much it's weighing and how much percentage is the dust, how much percentage is a fragment. And what is our aim is to make it dust. That is our aim. And here, here you, all the four energy has a fragmented. And it is possible to fragment a stone or a dust a stone or, to, or in a small, small fragment. It is possible to do that. And here you have, we have done this many number of cases. And to tell you, 100% clearance on a CT scan. So it is possible to use all these four energy and then you have a 100% clearance. So here again, this was a PCNL with the with the development of the uh, disposable flexible erotroscope. Uh, the uteric sheath has come out with the clear part has come out with the suction tube here, and this um, uh, tube can be passed inside the uh, ureter just like you are putting a ureteral sheath. The only thing is there is a suction. You can use a high irrigation. So with suction, you can uh, reduce the the intrarenal pressure as well as you can uh, you can suck out the fragment. Only problem is this tube goes up to the upper ureter or maybe in the pelvis if you use a long one. So it is it is not. So one has innovated uh, this okay, so into the ball. And this is the KVEC, which Glenn is going to speak. Uh, he is a very innovative. After you disintegrate the stone, you can pass a tube which is a malleable, which can be steerable into the every calyx on the, uh, you can see on the screen and you can go to each calyx and you can suck out. And then again, you can pass a urotroscope and you can um, uh, double check. So you can include suction um, with the flexible urotroscopy and do it. And this is Oris where uh, Jimmy Lingman and Mihir, they came, they, they, there is a, a, a PCNL, um, uh, the, a, a malleable, again, a tube, uh, which can suck the stone at the, at the tip of that suction. And then with the flexible erotroscope, you can break the stone and you can suck it out. And all this energy we have tried uh, in Nadia, then we are trying to see um, uh, whether with, with the dusting, and with the suction, if you can clear the stone completely. So, you know, in, in, the, in, in the third world, PCNL is very, very popular, while um, um, in, the, in the Western world, the flexible erotroscopy is very popular. So even if you are using a flexible erotroscopy, you can, with, with the presence of uh, energy now, you can dust the stone. And at the same time, with the different devices, you can suck it out. And for the large stone, of course, you can use the combination of RIRS and standard PCNL. On the other hand, uh, people like here, we can use a mini perk or micro perk or um, uh, standard PCNL and you can completely clear. Again, you can take a flexible utroscopy as in combination and clear the stone. So it is, um, um, it is a concept is that dusting the stone and uh, sucking out the fragment. So with this, um, I would like to um, uh, invite um, uh, Pushit Ghani to the speak on um, uh, the laser. He has done plenty of work uh, in the lab and to find out exactly how the uh, Moses fiber works. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Desai. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, yes. Okay, so I'm just gonna share the, the, the screen. Um, um, and Abhijit, how do I do the optimization? Sir, you can unshare it again. Mm -hmm. Share it, sir. And then you'll see an option of Come sharing right. optimization. Okay. Yes. Great, thank, thank you. you sir. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Desai, for the invitation to speak at this meeting. And, and it's a pleasure to do this in such uh, great faculty. So nice to see so many people. I'm just going to put my timer on so I'll stick to my 12 minutes. Uh, so I'd like to just cover um, dusting with the Moses technology and touch on some of the things that Dr. Desai spoke about in terms of um, aspects around suction and why I also think it's going to be an integral part of the future. We'll definitely see some exciting new developments in that when Dr. Uh, Preminger and Dr. Mihir Desai give us their talks. Um, these are my relevant disclosures, in particular, some of the laboratory work that we present, uh, that I'm presenting is funded by Boston Scientific Investigator Grant. So I'd like to just take a step back and ask ourselves, do we truly understand uh, the uh, fragmentation aspects of laser lithotripsy? Uh, I'd like to then talk a little bit about why suction is important, and then I'll tell you uh, some of the data around MOSIS technology and fragmentation outcomes. So fragmentation uh, methods for laser lithotripsy, when it first came out, there was some debate as to whether uh, fragmentation occurred through a photoacoustic or photomechanical method, such as what you see uh, acoustic with shockwave lithotripsy. But work by you know, doctors uh, Lingerman, Preminger, and Teichman uh, in the you know, late 80s, early 90s started to uh, understand that actually most of the mechanism is occurring through a photothermal aspect. More recently, there has been interest around a mechanism called thermomechanical, otherwise known as explosive vaporization. Uh, and th there are also investigators in, in Dr. Preminger's group at Duke who, who feel that there is some element of photoacoustic. So I don't think this is a, a done deal, but there are three methods that we need to be aware about when we're using a laser to break up the stone. So it's photothermal, photoacoustic, thermomechanical, and the majority of it is photothermal. If we look at this um, uh, um, breakdown of mechanistic aspects from uh, Dr. Teichman's review paper from Journal of Endourology some years back. Um, why I want to show this is that what we're trying to achieve with, with uh, dusting is to get this area here where we're going to be able to shave the stone and create very, very small fragments because the smaller the fragments, the better they will evacuate. And in any suction methods, we want small fragments so that they are able to be evacuated without causing clogging. Uh, when Dr. Krambeck uh, speaks, we'll hear about the, the, the trilogy and those devices that are used in PCNL. And we all know when we do those procedures, we want the fragment size to be manageable so that the system can go where they broke down the different mechanisms. And the, you can see that the longer the pulse duration you get, you can get photothermal ablation, but you also get collateral thermal damage. And that's a really important thing to think about as we start to develop lasers that have longer and longer pulse durations. So I'd like to just speak about the Moses system in this talk. And in the Moses system, this is the interface that you see. And you, you, we get to choose between different pulse durations. We can get to select our pulse energy, our pulse frequency. Uh, with this, you can use pulse modulation with the Moses technology, which I'll speak in a little bit more detail later. And an important factor is to always know what the total power is because high power lasers have arrived at allowing us to pulverize the stone much more quickly, but it's also important for us to know that total power because there are some safety aspects around high power, especially around heat generation. And all of these parameters work together to cause fragmentation, reduce retropulsion, and also to reduce fiber burnback. So as we think about total power and on that concept, I'd like to now just um, say, why active suction would be important. And it's really around addressing some concerns around heat, uh, addressing concerns around vision. Uh, already Dr. Desai has mentioned intrarenal pressure. And really another factor is efficiency. Um, I haven't put in here outcomes, but it looks like the work that they've been doing at MPUH with the suction technique for their percutaneous procedures is they're able to get 100% clearance. And maybe with active suction, we will start to uh, go towards better and better stone outcomes. If we think about heat generation, this is work from my partner, Will Roberts in our laboratory, where they um, did some heat generation studies in an in vivo porcine model in, in pigs that were anesthetized. And what we found is that when you have, um, when you apply 40 watts of energy for 
for 60 seconds of continuous firing, you get a buildup into the temperature. And that buildup in temperature will depend on the flow rate. And so when you have no irrigation, you get very high temperatures that can be injurious. If you have medium irrigation, such as a meter height gravity drainage, you can reach uh, dangerous temperatures. But if you have high irrigation, those uh, high temperatures are mitigated. So that's why when we do um, high power laser lithotripsy, we use high irrigation rates. Other strategies to reduce heat are listed here. But one thing that I think in the future that we're going to start seeing is active suction. The other problems with dusting is vision. And you can see here, this I'm dusting a, a stone in the renal pelvis, uh, lots of debris, uh, had to stop and start. And we use access sheets to help us promote drainage, to improve our vision. But one of the factors about vision, and, and especially with the dusting technique, as noted by this comment from Dr. Traxer, is you know, it may make us stop and start, especially when we're using high frequency. And so Efficiency is an important aspect. And one of the reasons why many surgeons actually don't like uh, dusting technique is because of poor vision and stopping and starting. Uh, we address that by increasing our irrigation rate, but um, there are concerns that high irrigation rate, we're not mitigated with an access sheath, et cetera, may lead to high intrarenal pressure. And that can be injurious, such as noted by this comment by Dr. Gristie. And then Dr. Bultitude uh, also made a comment around dusting and the, and, the, and the role of high temperatures and how that is an important factor, as I mentioned. And the last thing I want to explain is that in terms of laser lithotripsy, the greatest fragmentation occurs when the stone is uh, on uh, the laser fiber tip. But the further and further the stone to laser fiber dis distance increases, we'll get uh, less fragmentation. And if you're at three millimeters and, and beyond, there is no fragmentation occurring. So a method to actively suck and to bring the stone closer and closer to the fiber tip will have advantages in terms of improving fragmentation. So what is the Moses technology? It's a pulse modulation where we were able to split this single uh, uh, vapor bubble of a long pulse or a short pulse profile into two pulses in rapid sequence. And, the, and the, these videos show what they look like under the uh, high-speed imaging. And there are two types of Moses uh, bubbles that you can choose for in the Moses system. One is called Moses contact, which has a small initial bubble and then a larger, bigger bubble. Uh, where it says Moses distance that has two equally sized uh, and symmetrical split pulses. And it's the Moses distance that I use a lot when I'm doing dusting in the kidney. Um, this is a, a, just a freeze frame of all these different um, pulse profiles. And you can see here that the Moses has these split uh, pulse sequence compared to a short pulse or a long pulse bubble. And what we found in the laboratory is that using a Moses distance uh, to break up the stone in contact actually led to around 28% more fragmentation. And that was in a controlled environment using a bigger stone. So of course there are some limitations when we're doing work like that in the laboratory. What do we see um, outside the laboratory, let's say using human kidney stones. And so this is a simulation model of a calcium oxalate monohydrate stone uh, with a little bit of uric acid. And you can see here, it's the same stone um, in, a, in a Kalis seal simulation model using um, on the left hand side a, a dusting setting but without Moses mode uh, it's a short pulse mode and on the right hand side we're using the Moses distance mode and my observations when I operate and when I've been doing the work in the lab is that I find that the Moses mode leads to much more smaller and fine fragments and I think that's a really important outcome when it comes to uh, suction and evacuation. The other advantage of the Moses uh, distance mode is that, as I showed you in that graph, as you get further and further from the kidney stone, your uh, fragmentation efficiency reduces. And so with the Moses distance mode at one millimeter, there is double the fragmentation that would normally occur when you're using a standard mode such as short pulse. So that's important because when we're dusting, we're always moving, we're interrogating the stone and we spend some of our time on contact. We'll send spun some of our time a millimeter away, some of our time more than a millimeter away. And, and, and Will Roberts in our laboratory with Tim Hall studied this and found that actually when surgeons are operating in a simulation model, they spent only 30% of the time actually was on contact. So the vast majority of the time is, is off the stone. And that's why we use Moses distance 
for kidney stone dusting. The other thing that we found when we're using a, an advanced pulse modulation such as MOSES is, and this is a recent study that was just published in World Journal of Urology. And if you look at the different settings here at 20 watts of setting, and if you compare short pulse to MOSES distance mode, the amount of fluid at mass that is, that is disintegrated and lost in the fluid and the, uh, and the amount of smaller and smaller fragments is much better when you're using a pulse modulated mode. And again, this is important. Dr. Desai mentioned about the two millimeter cutoff. So you can see here that when you're using Moses distance at 20 watt settings, you have far fewer larger fragments. And those larger fragments have significance in terms of both if you leave them in the patient for recurrence and retreatment, but I think also for the technologies as we think about uh, active suction. And this is a high speed imaging of the, of the two different modes, a short pulse and a Moses distance. And what you're seeing is that with the Moses vapor bubble, you reach further uh, and that reach is that's why you're able to break the stone from distance. And th this was also noted by Dr. Traxer's group that when they studied this with, uh, you know, in, in their laboratory with their chemists, they found that, you know, comparatively the Moses technology produces more pr pronounced changes when it comes to a photothermal effect. So going back to that original graph that I showed you, along with all those uh, mechanistic aspects, it's this photothermal mechanism that's really important to ablate the stone and cause fine, fine fragments that just vaporize or come off that are so tiny that we don't need to worry about and are able to be sucked out with ease. And so this is just a video of, of a kidney stone case where we're dusting using the Moses distance function. And you can see that there are some flashes and there's some, there's some charring and you can see those marks on the stone. And, and what, what I've been trying to do more recently is break the stone with Moses distance by just staying a millimeter or a half a millimeter away. That's really hard to do uh, technically. And I think in the future, we may see robotic platforms that allow us to do that much better. But, uh, and we'll hear more about robots from Dr. Mihir Desai. But if you can see this here, you can see how I think that with this type of pulse modulation, you get a very, very fine ablation and you get almost like a melting effect on the stone. In this particular case, I started at 21 watts, and then I had to increase because it was a harder stone, so I increased to 28 watts. But I'm very conscious about the total power that I put in when I'm dusting a stone. And I just wanna make a comment that this demonstration of hot, glowing hot stone, as you saw those charring effects, was even noted by Dr. Lingerman in 1998 when they studied this in their laboratory and as evidence for a thermal effect of the laser tip. Um, so I, I, I've reached the end of my time. I welcome any discussion later on in the, in the, in the panel. Um, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to present this and look forward to the remaining talks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kushit. It was a very nice um, um, <coughs> technical information that you have given. And um, now we'll um, ask Dr. Chandramohan uh, to talk about uh, his experience with the thulium and how the thulium works um, in the stone management. Uh, good evening, sir. At the outset, I thank uh, Dr. Mahesh Desha, sir, and the MPUH team for giving this opportunity. I'm very happy to be with the esteemed speakers here. Uh, with my experience of one and a half year using thulium fiber laser, I'm giving this talk. The homium laser is no doubt uh, for last 20 years has proven its uh, uh, role in lithotripsy, laser lithotripsy. Now, all the articles, what we are seeing now, thulium fiber laser of last two years, 2019-2018, even though research work has been done from 2003, they are comparing with the uh, homium YAG laser. Uh, everybody knows that uh, these two names have come from Swedish. Uh, they are basically rare elements, homium and thulium. This is the mission supplied by IPG in India. This slide, everybody is familiar now because last one year, majority of the uh, thulium talks is not going to be without this slide. Primarily, it is not YAG laser. It is diode laser. The photons will go into the silica, very small, thin 
10 to 20 micrometer silica, which is delivered outside through a very small, like 50 microns, 100 microns, 150 microns size laser fiber. That is the biggest advantage of this. And the, everybody asks a simple question. If thulium uh, doped one is a continuous laser, how it works in stone? It is basically electronically modified in a pulsatile manner. Without pulsatile manner, probably it will not work in lithotripsy. The major advantage, second one is its absorption. Primary, as Kurshit Ghani told, it is a photothermal effect which produces the stone lithotripsy. So water should absorb the energy, become heat, and then make the stone powder. That has maximum efficiency with the thulium fiber laser that is at 1950 nanometers wavelength. And this is an important slide where we are talking about the homium, uh, the 120 watt Moses effect. Primary mechanism of thulium itself is a cylinder type of the wave. If you see here in the second one, a continuous wave. There it is two bubbles. Here it is a continuous wave. That means uh, the, the maximum efficiency will be delivered to the stone. Uh, there is a wide range of uh, uh, pulse energy, frequency, pulse duration we can modulate in this. It is like having five gears versus 15, 20 gear sports vehicle. Depending on the road, depending on the situation, you can change it. Imagine 0 0.025 energy is available. Sometimes you don't feel that you are dusting for our eyes. Frequency is going up to 2000 Hz. Normally, we cannot go more than 80 Hz in even 100, 120 watts uh, homium. Pulse duration, even though uh, Kurshit Ghani sir told that long pulse duration is not good, but sometimes uh, if you want to make quickly in a localized calyx, it produces fine dust. The ultimate concept of today, what Dr. Mahesh Desai sir explained is that if you leave any stone, whether it is an RIRS or PCNL, the chances of regrowth and failure is more. So on the table, if you can see clear with suction, then you have to dust or make particles in such a way that they come out of the suction. This already I have told. See, the laser fiber also is very thin in thulium fiber laser. Now coming to the, some of the articles which say dusting efficiency is twice that of the homium. Naturally being homium laser as the gold standard as of now, everything is compared with that and that reduces the operative time. Retropulsion, uh, four times lower than the short pulse mode and uh, 1.8 times lower than the Moses mode. Overall, 28 millimeters per second, it moves initial speed. That's what they say. The same thing is uh, confirmed here that re retropulsion is two times less with the uh, this thing. Fiber burn back, honestly, in the last one and a half year, maybe I might have used around 200, 300 cases I have not changed and ordered another laser fiber. It really does not burn back because this silica fiber and the laser, thulium fiber laser, their co coefficiency is very good and laser does not burn back even though it produces such high temperature. And regarding the 150, uh, 200 micron, whether it will break or not, for example, if you use high energy, sometimes it breaks at the 15 centimeter junction or at the uh, nephroscope entry point. This is important, but uh, the Churan at all has told that such type of uh, uh, unsafe is not there with these small laser fibers. Coming to the operating time, as already told, you have to use less energy to break the stone. It forms small vapor bubbles and collateral damage is less. But one important point is it's a coagulative laser also. It is not like homeo, which is cutting laser. The 100 million question is temperature raise. Everybody is concerned. Naturally, all our photothermal effects without raise of temperature, it will not happen. The basic thing what we are doing is the irrigation. If you put a 14 axis sheet, water comes out very fast. If you do super and PCNL, water may come fast. If you have an appropriate size of the nephroscope, water may come fast. In such situations, the temperature may not raise. But five minutes, if you use continuously with 50 watts, 79 degrees centigrade is reported, which is not good for the uh, body, uh, body tissues. So irrigation or stop in between, as Pushit Ghani told, is better, especially if you don't have the vision. Here, one more study from Larian Dragas at all tell that there is no difference in the temperature. 
Now visibility, definitely if you increase the frequency, particularly in thulium, you lose the vision. If you lose the vision, there is no problem if you are in a calyx where you know the anatomy, especially middle calyx where you don't have much thing to damage there uh, and adequate space is there. But in case of pelvis, in case of infundibula, in case of ureter, you cannot use such high frequency to dust the, this thing. So safety, uh, majority of the articles as of now are saying that it is very safe. Even in PCNL, they said that 85% success rate and an average time of 23 minutes. And Martov et al. showed that in mini perk and uh, uh, ultra mini perk papers are also there from Oliver Traxer last few months back. Small stone, they are using thulium. Because the outflow is less, they are telling it is safe. They have taken eight minutes time to finish. With this, I will show my experience, four or five videos. See here, I have shown in a bladder stone, all settings, how to make the dust and fragments. For example, in bladder, 0.1 and 60. So you don't appreciate even the powder. It at 0.1 to 100, you slightly see what is happening, but really you don't see the, uh, it's almost like water flow. Once you make to 200, you will make the pieces. Once you make the 200 frequency, see now the pieces size is increasing. For bladder, they may not be very important. For RIRS, they are very important. Once you make 300, large pieces will form. That means even though you can go up to 300, you have to be remembering that in kidney when you are doing less than 100 or 150 is better. This is at 300. Now, when you increase the energy, more impact, 0 0.2, 100, it is reasonably good. Small pieces at the same time faster. But once you go to 0 0.2, suddenly center of the stone breaks. In RIRS, this is not good. Especially in pelvis, it is not at all good. But in PCNL, this may be sucked out the way the Mahesh Deshasar is telling. You, your, your fragment sizes are different with various technologies, but ultimately we have to know which surgery we are doing, where we are located. Inferior calyx, better not to leave any fragments, they grow and they may not be able to suck. In bladder, all these fragments can be sucked with 18 French R, 22 French nephroscope with just simple elix evacuator. Now coming to the uh, thulium and homium, you see in a live workshop, we were doing similar type of the stone, one with 0.5 joules and 20 hertz. See the difference. Microchipping, to my observation, is more clearly observed in homium, whereas in thulium, some amount of vaporization happens. Even we can smell, even we can smell if you do continuously for five minutes, the RIRS. So, but at the end when the fragments are there, the thulium is very fast. If you really want to make powder in RIRS in a calyx, if you keep for one minute, the very fast uh, uh, movement of the stones and very fine powder happens. This is beyond doubt proven in the literature that in a localized calyx, you can break the stone faster and go into it. Now coming to the uh, uh, three years baby, a supine uh, super pair. Why the reason is large stone? Why I'm telling is that the, I'm doing pediatric a little more as my patients are told. Uh, the safety of the uh, this laser in the kidney, for example, whether it is burning the mucosa or not like that, it is a case of a large stone burden. So I have not attempted RIRS. Directly I have gone for the supine PCNL. Uh, this is the uh, picture, which is a very easy case. Then we punctured the in inferior calyx. Easy in the sense uh, PCS is dilated. Once you went inside, we have used here suction made by Indian super perk where these small fragments are taken out. But there are no, no fragmentation. You carefully watch here on the surface, you don't see any fragmentation because this is 100 Hz and 0.5 joules. You are eating away the stone without seeing even powder because every small dust particle is sucked out. When I have shown uh, on the, on the gauge piece, you will see very, very, very fine powder. At the end, when the, when the surface area is same, volume is less, those fragments can be sucked out by the instruments what Mahesh Deshaisar is telling. But volume is more, they cannot be sucked out. This is about the, uh, uh, the RIR is in a large stone. What will you do in large stone? Will you dust for a long time and take time? This is a two centimeter upper calicial stone. This is the ideal case for RIRS. You should not spend time. Now you go here, you don't make powder. Liberally you perforate. This is called perforation technique, which in the last Pushit uh, Ganya has shown, you perforate purposefully the retropulsion in the laser fiber and a blast sheet problem is not there in the, this thing. So you make fragments. One more advantage is once you make 5mm fragments, they float and true popcorn effect causes 
and then pop dusting happens when pop dusting happens you will produce very 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 fine dust for example at the end of this uh, uh, around 10 minutes 20 minutes if you can do in upper calyx like this see this is the dust at the end we produced but the only problem is vision temperature and continuous outflow if the stent is not done before if 12 by french uh, 14 french is not used you may injure the mucosa that studies only will prove now lower calycial stone what will you do you cannot do dusting you cannot see all this stone in such cases you put the laser fiber make it fragments and keep at the low frequency low energy so that it will keep on moving and spend time in such cases even if it touches the mucosa it produces only coagulation whereas in uh, homium it produces a cutting effect in such cases you will get bleeding any small bleeding in such cases you have to abandon and stone free rate is uh, uh, zero last case ectopic kidney where an important part is that the anatomy of the ectopic kidney if you move the stones into small calyces your sfr will go down you cannot go into such stones this is a big stone in the large capacious pelvis see how much bending is there and then small laser fiber of uh, 100 microns if comes you can do in situ also see one small stone is taken back and put it into the major stone important thing is it should not move you should always do the small stone first because in the midst of the powder it may not be seen this small stone is not moving no retropulsion here after after some time it moves when the volume is very less now i am going to the main stone and main stone if you continuously do one one layer like in a book the never decrease the surface area to decrease the retropulsion these fragments one more advantage in thulium is that in the pelvis you can do popcorn localized normally it is difficult with the homium because it burns and fragments move away very fast here they come it has suction effect because of the high frequency so this is a um, uh, uh, two years baby where uh, if you go in a um, um, rirs large stone burden like uh, this is the uh, this is the external genitalia very small baby here we are using uh, um, because dilatation can be done in the female patient now i am going inside there is, uh, passing the access sheet big see there is no vision here but we know where you are in a calyx it is very fast outflow is very good in the left hand you can see on the hand and the suction the irrigation is done at the end you see calyces are not damaged papilla is nicely seen no thermal damage you can inspect at the end with good vision but faster this is a fine dust produced in 2 years baby so with that uh, i will uh, the, the this is again same at the last slide you, the this can be used again uh, no conflicts of interest but this can be used for the enucleation very well 60 watts it can do nice on the right side slide you can see the the uh, bladder tumor we are we are sending histopathology separately to see thermal effect but see the muscle fibers how nicely it is seen so with this we say that it has a good uh, dusting ability faster dusting ability definitely it will be most promising alternative to homium lag for lithotripsy and studies are in the early stage probably in a couple of years this will be the future thank you my team helping me thank you very much thank you once again mahesh sir for giving this opportunity to me I think uh, Dr. Mahesh Desai has lost the connection. So we go to the next talk. Very nice, Chandramohan. You demonstrated very nicely about uh, how the dusting can be obtained with the thulium fiber. Now Sir. we go next uh, to the trialogy talk, and uh, I invite uh, Dr. Amy for uh, her talk on trialogy for PCNL, a modern day lithotripsy. Over to you, Dr. Amy, please. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, I'm setting my timer here. Very nice, Chandramohan. Okay. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. It's just a, such a great honor to be part of this amazing team. I think team. we'll go to the Amy. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you yes, hear me? Please, please, please go ahead. I can hear okay. you. Okay. Um, so I just have a few disclosures that I, I work for Boston Scientific Luminous in um, Sauna Motion. So for this talk, after, I'm talking about after we've gotten the perfect puncture and we try to choose the device that works best for us in a PCNL. 
And when we do this, we're looking at efficiency, stone-free rates, complications, ease of use of the device and the ergonomics of the device. So I think originally when we first started testing equipment, we were thinking really about stone-free, but now there's so many different items available that you have to think about other uh, issues as well. And there are multiple different lithotrites available, and most of these are going to be covered today by the speakers, but I'm focusing on a combination uh, of ultrasound and ballistic device, the Trilogy. So the EMS Lithoclast Trilogy device is a dual energy single probe system. It has electromagnetic, ballistics, ultrasound, and a simultaneous suction, as well as water cooling. Uh, the stones are caught in a stone catcher, and it has a built-in troubleshooting mechanism. Unfortunately, because of this built-in electromagnetic, ballistic, and ultrasound with the water cooling device, it is quite heavy, and the handpiece comes in at 1.2 kilograms, which is significantly heavier than any other device that's currently used for PCNL. Uh, one advantage of the trilogy is that the probes come in multiple different sizes, so it goes down to four French and up past 12 French. So you can use it for a standard PCNL or mini PCNL um, or anything in between that you may wish to use it for. This original bench data was uh, provided by Boston Scientific, and they compared trilogy versus shock pulse versus Swiss lithoclast. They tested the devices on one centimeter bago stones and they did 10 trials each. In this study, Trilogy was 48% faster at stone removal with 25 times greater ballistic tip movement and 16 times greater ultrasound probe movement. Um, in a real world study done by Dr. Preminger's group, the results were a little bit different. So Trilogy was again uh, tested on the bench against multiple different devices, including the shock pulse, the ultrasound select. Um, and the Trilogy was the superior platform for stone clearance when the lithotriptor was handheld. However, for one and two centimeter uh, Bago stone, the clearance was fastest with the shock pulse. But when they did it head to head all together, this, this improvement of the shock pulse over the Trilogy washed out. Um, so basically this shows that they're all quite efficient and there may be some little variations with technique. I was fortunate enough to be one of the uh, trial sites for the clinical LME. So it was tested at uh, Indiana University, UC Irvine and UCSD and we collected data for the first two months of use. And you can see that these are fairly large stones around 272 millimeters squared surface area. Um, standard PCNL practice at all three sites. We had 25 patients and 29 renal units treated with the Trilogy uh, lithotri lithotriptor. When we looked at mean stone clearance time for, for the stone group overall, it was about seven minutes. That's exceptionally fast. And the stone clearance rate was a mean of 82 min 88 millimeters squared per minute. So this is very fast. Ergonomically, the score was somewhat low at 6.5 on a scale of uh, one to 10, um, but otherwise the other scores were fairly high. When we looked at device malfunctions over the two month period, we only had one device malfunction, which was suction. And it was one of the first cases. And I think that maybe the device wasn't set up properly, um, but otherwise we had no malfunctions and um, ease of managing setup, troubleshooting and, um, a setup before and after the case, which was me measured by the OR staff, was very high uh, rated on the scale. So in my overall personal experience, I would say that Trilogy is highly efficient. It works well for hard stones. It also works well for very soft stones, such as matrix stones, which can be difficult to remove. And I think that's because of the large lumen and suction capabilities. I never have to troubleshoot this device it rarely ever breaks down. And actually our OR manager and team requested that we convert to the Trilogy because it was so easy to run and use. Um, however, I would say that the weight does produce a little bit of low satisfaction from my standpoint because it is a heavy device. Um, when we compare that LME outcome to other published literature, we can look at this study by York, which was published in JNDO in 2017. And you can see that in this study, they compared the Cyber Wand to the Lithoclast Select to the Stonebreaker. 
and the clearance time was around 26, 23, 28 minutes, so close to a half hour. And if you remember, the clearance time in the trilogy LME was seven minutes. You look at the clearance rate in the study where it was about 30 to 24 millimeters squared per minute, depending on the device. And the trilogy was 88 millimeters squared per minute. So clearly it's operating at a much faster pace than these older devices. Uh, furthermore, in the study by York, you can see that around seven to 14% of the time they had to convert to a different device to complete the case. And in none of the cases performed to date have we ever had to convert from trilogy. Furthermore, their stone-free rates were around 50%. And our stone-free rates in the LME were 84% when we combined all three sites. When we talk about reliability, I, I brought up the fact that the Trilogy does not malfunction. When you look at other series that have been published, the device malfunction rates for the CyberWan, LUS2, Stonebreaker, Lithoclass, and Eurotron range from 9 to 32% with a mean of 11 to 17%, meaning 11 to 17% of the time you need to stop the case and fix the device because it's not working correctly. For all the published literature on Trilogy, it ranges between zero to 4.7%. So you're much less likely to have to stop the case. So the future direction is this prospect of randomized multi-centered study comparing Trilogy versus Shock Pulse. And we actually hope to finish it this week. We have 95% of patients enrolled. We had to take a three month hiatus because of COVID, but now we're back operating and we hope that this week it will finally be completed. But what I'm presenting is the interim analysis. So we took patients and randomized them uh, to either having the Trilogy or the shock pulse used for their case during the standard PCNL. This would be a 24 French access sheath. Um, and the stone surface area in the interim analysis is between 366 to 411 millimeters squared. And these are pretty standard PCNLs. Uh, when we compared the case duration, it tended to favor Trilogy being a little bit faster for an overall surgery. Uh, however, that was not quite statistically significant. But we did note that there was a significant higher number of device malfunctions in the shock pulse group. Uh, and the clearance time was extremely fast in both groups, around 111 to 110 millimeters squared per minute. When we looked at the stone-free rate on an initial pass, the stone-free rate was much higher with the Trilogy, and these patients were less likely to require a secondary procedure. And this may be a reflection of the suction capability of the Trilogy. Uh, furthermore, when we did a multivariate analysis and compared stone surface size over time, you can see that as the stone surface increases or as the stone increases in size, the amount of time to remove the stone is not really affected by the Trilogy where it is affected by the shock pulse, meaning that the Trilogy is effective whether it's a small stone or a large stone um, at, at about the same rate, whereas the rate decreases with the shock pulse. So I just wanted to take you through a quick case of the trilogy in the last few minutes. And this is a complex large stone in the upper pole. Um, setting up the trilogy, you need to screw in the probe. And then there is a wrench that you must use to tighten it on. I can't tell you how important this step is because the, the probe will actually shoot off the end of the device if you don't click it into place. And then it has a separate suction that is then passed off to a stone collection device and then to the device itself. Uh, after the perfect access, you all know how to get access, but uh, triangulation with fluoroscopy uh, is performed. And then once we're in place, the Trilogy device is in use. You can see that there's almost no fragments created. The, the fragment is immediately suctioned up into the probe as soon as it's created. And I think this is what's contributing to that higher stone free rate. Uh, you don't have a chance for fragments to uh, float away. And this was the end result of that particular case that you can see the fragment size is actually quite large, but because the lumen of the probe is so large, you can easily get those fragments out. There are some subtle nuances with the Trilogy device and mainly how you hold the handpiece. Um, I do prone PCNL and it is heavy. So for me, I don't like to use the handle. I would rather hold it more like a standard ultrasound probe 
and keep the handle away from me. The other thing is with the Trilogy device, there's a lot of options and a lot of set settings that you can change. I generally start with an impact of around 80, a frequency between four and six hertz. The ultrasound, I always turn up to 100%, and the suction I keep around 50%. All of these um, components can be varied, but that's where I like to start. And if the stone is hard, then I increase the impact to 100% and the frequency to about 10 to 12 hertz. Um, in those settings, you need to avoid the urethelium because it can damage the urethelium, but at the lower settings, it's very safe. What I also like about the Trilogy is it has a center line, which will tell you if you're bending the probe. And as I've said multiple times, the handpiece is heavy, so you can have a tendency to bend the probe and the device will alert you if you're bending it too much um, and you're not as efficient as you should be. So after finishing the stone removal, I'll usually use a flexible nephroscope to do a final mapping. And you can see in this case that there is just nothing left. It's completely clean and clear. There are no fragments um, and it was a highly efficient stone removal. And then leave a small tube in the back um, and usually remove it the next morning and the patient did well. So in conclusion, I think with standard PCNL, a novel combination device, seems superior. Uh, stone clearance rate may be similar among many of the current era lithotripters, but I think with true ultrasound ballistic, you may get a better outcome with a harder stone, such as cysteine, brush eye, and COM. You also need to consider alternative characteristics when you select an optimal system. You need to think about the ergonomics. Will the device malfunction? Will you have to be troubleshooting a lot because that will extend your OR time? And what's the cost of the device? So thank you, and again, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this presentation. Thank you, Amy. Um, did you ever break the probe? I have never broke the probe, um, but one of my fellows did one time. <laughs> and I, I did a couple of times. It is always breaks near the handle. Somebody yes. To keep somebody to keep a watch. I don't bend too much, you know. Yeah, I have, I've actually asked Boston Scientific to add an audible, audible alarm to it because I, I'm not always looking at that indicator to tell me that it's bending. And I think if it, if it had a noise that it made, you would be more aware of it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the lovely talk. Now I'll um, invite Dr. Subnis to talk about shock pulse. Dr. Subnis. Yes, sir. Well, it was a wonderful uh, demonstration by Dr. Amy, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit similar sort of energy with the suction, and that's a shock pulse. So shock pulse, uh, uh, whether it's a new standard for dusting and suction. As today, we are going to discuss about the dusting and suction. First, before we start talking about the shock pulse, what are the benefits? Let us see as to what are the what is the ideal stone breaking energy source should be. Well, it should be a uh, powerful to break hard stones when especially when we are talking of a PCNL should have the effective simultaneous suction should be of a variable sizes to be used in uh, conventional as well as the mini perk. It should have a less maintenance and it should have a very low initial cost. As uh, has been highlighted in the previous uh, talks that the future of uh, stone management, whether it's the RIRS or whether it is the uh, stone uh, the PCNL, it is the uh, dusting and the suction, which is going to be the important thing. And the whole uh, management is going to revolve around the dusting and suction. So it should be uh, the uh, any energy source should form a dust or the fragment sufficient enough to be sucked out. Whatever uh, energy source which you are using or a sheet you are using, it should be sucked out from that. The suction can be on the sheet when you are doing PCNL or on the probe. Suction on the probe has many advantages uh, because it simultaneously sucks out uh, very efficiently. And if the energy is powerful and suction is effective, then that's the best combination uh, you can have uh, during PCNL. Well, when we talk of this uh, combination, uh, the uh, shock pulse is the one which fulfills all that combination. It has got the ultrasonic energy and it has got a ballistic energy, which is a combination of a, a both energy and that is delivered through a single probe. So it delivers the constant ultrasonic energy at a probe tip 
there is a intermittent ballistic energy which is uh, delivered at the tip of the probe and combination of a bro, uh, both a breaks the stone and sucks the fragments very effectively uh well if you have to see what exactly is the shock pulse from this graph you can understand that it delivers the ultrasonic energy at the frequency of the 21 hertz per second and it delivers intermittently the ballistic energy which is created by the electrokinetic energy and the uh, so that is delivered by about 300 hertz per second so for every 21000 it has got uh, the 300 uh, frequency uh, per second now how it is generated in the probe and how it is delivered you can see here that that's a piezo uh, element which is there and there is a return spring and from here whatever the energy which is delivered the transform the electric energy into mechanical energy and that is how it is transmitted to a probe and that is how it is transmitted to the uh, stone so what happens actually at the stone side well you have to contact the stone and when the probe comes in contact with the stone the piezoelectric excitation of a crystal causes rapid oscillation of a probe to fragment the stone so that's a mechanical energy which is delivered on the stone and that hits the stone and that causes rapid fragmentation now at the same time the ultrasonic energy is delivered at the very high rate of 21000 uh, hertz per second so that is how the oscillations are occurring at the tip of the probe and that is what is also breaking the stone and simultaneously it is sucking out the fine dust or the fragments which are been created by both these energy so that is how the combination of the ultrasound as well as the ballistic work now as uh, dr ami showed the uh, the shock pulse also has a very uh, user friendly design uh, this is how the uh, probe look like and the advantage as against to lithoclast master or the other previous energy sources is that the whole suction uh, the whole hollow cylinder is available for the fragments to be sucked out meaning thereby the uh, the ultrasonic and the ballistic energy is transmitted to a single probe which is also again the same thing in the trilogy so trilogy and shock pulse basically uh, are the same in the form of delivering the energy and both of them have a very high uh, the field or the hollow probe which is available the area which is available for the uh, fragments or the dust or whatever which is being created to be sucked out this is how the uh, the uh, hand probe looks like you have the adjustment although the trilogy has the adjustment which can be made and which can be seen on the panel the uh, shock pulse doesn't have that uh, sort of a uh, thing but uh, here you can uh, by the rotational movement of this uh, probe you can increase or decrease the suction you can see here that there is a plus sign and a negative sign if you uh, the uh, uh, rotate the probe here you will have the bigger suction if you rotate on that side you have the suction which is minimized and you have adjustment the high power and the standard power if you think that the stone is very hard then the uh, you can select the high power you can if the stone is little softer you can use the Uh, standard uh, power uh, for the uh, for the delivery now this is the comparison of uh, the uh, probe sizes and the uh, the uh, the suction uh, uh, diameter which is available and you can see here that the shock pulse has the widest diameter available as compared to the cyber wand and the previous uh, this the trilogy also has a similar thing the lithoclast mass had the lithoclast probe which was going inside the probe and therefore uh, there was little bit less area for the uh, fragments to be sucked out now uh, again the shock pulse also comes in a different sizes and therefore you have the variety of probe which you can select you can select the uh, probe which is used for bladder probe which is used for the ureteric stone uh, which is come in the longer size you have the probe which is uh, which can be used for the mini pcnl it can go through the uh, mini pcnl uh, probe and then you have the uh, bigger probe size which is available for the standard pcnl so if you use a bigger size sheet the 24 french uh, wolf ureteroscope or a 20 french uh, uh, dresden wolf uh, nephroscope then you can use the bigger probe size and then you have the um, higher energy and the bit, uh, bigger area for the fragments to be sucked out this is the how the shock pulse uh, machine looks like this is the uh, console this is the uh, the this is the shock pulse 
it is also uh, comparatively less li uh, light uh, weight and uh, this is how the uh, probe uh, can be fitted upon now here you can see that um, the probe can be fitted it is a very uh, simple design uh, plug and uh, start plug and play model uh, type of a thing and uh, the important thing is that the probe has to be fitted properly into the uh, inside if you don't fit it properly the adequate energy will not be transmitted and there will be problem behind you can attach a suction and once you attach the suction then it is uh, it is quite easy for uh, for this to be used so this is how it can be uh, used this is where this is what i was talking that you have to fit it properly if you don't fit it if there is a if it is loose then the adequate energy will not be transmitted and you will not get a proper uh, proper effect so once you fit it properly then it is ready to be used and uh, i will just demonstrate a few cases uh, how we have used it uh, the shock pulse this is the stone with the bilateral stone one side was cleared completely and we focus on the right side this was a stone which was uh, to be cleared up and you can see here that it is 3.8 by 1.8 cm size uh, quite a big stone with a hu hard hard stone with a hu of 1500 so you can see that it's a very hard stone and the ct scan shows a significantly dilated system and a very hard uh, stone uh, you can see here and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is what is the uh, stone and this is what uh, the uh, 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 the procedure well even though it was a 3.8 cm stone hard stone we decided to do mini perk this is how the puncture is done once the puncture is done dilated the track and the uh, 16 frame size stars mini perk was used and a 1.8 mm is 1.83 mm probe was used now you can see here that uh, the uh, the probe can be passed through the mini pcnl and you can see that uh, it's uh, such a powerful that the stone actually creates a tunnel in the uh, in the in the stone and uh, simultaneously even though it is only 1.83 uh, mm diameter probe whatever fragments which are formed whatever dust which is formed is being effectively sucked out and you can see that um, such a big stone can be effectively uh, broken the suction uh, you can see that uh, the uh, it can be completely cleared and few fragments uh, uh, can be uh, can be removed and that is how you get the complete clearance of a stone and once you get complete clearance small nephrostomy can be kept and that is how the even the mini perk and you can see that this is what is the fragments which have been uh, sucked out uh, in the uh, through the probe so next day you can take the x ray and you can uh, see complete clearance so such a big stone such a hard stone can be cleared effectively efficiently uh, with the with the shock pulse this is another example uh, of a stagon stone you can see that uh, there is a uh, there is a stone in this calyx there is a stone in this calyx and it has got a Uh, uh anterior posterior calyx with the pelvis uh, occupying the whole stone and the functioning kidney so here we use the standard uh, pcnl first the lower calyx uh, puncture was uh, taken and we knew that, we knew that uh, it is going to require uh, two punctures so a second puncture was uh, made in the beginning itself uh, the wire was uh, introduced uh, it's a very hard stone wire was introduced and one by one the tract was uh, being used uh, here you can see that we put, put a standard pcnl amplage sheet was uh, put and the bigger size nephroscope was uh, 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 introduced and then uh, once the stone was visualized uh, since it was a big size probe uh, the probe uh, the fragmentation was started <coughs> here you can see that with the big uh, bigger probe uh, the whole uh, stone can be broken very very fast the suction can be uh, very very effective the uh, suction is sucking out all the dust all the powder all the fragments which are being uh, passed out uh, which are being created and once you uh, clear up the stone this is a uh, what we have observed so far we have done about uh, 280 cases with the shock pulse <coughs> and what we have found that uh, uh, the uh, the power and the suction is so effective that actually hardly any time you have to use the forceps to remove the stone as against to a lithoclast if you use then <coughs> you have to use uh, you have to break the stone 
and remove those fragments uh, with the forceps with the shock pulse or along with the trilogy the powerful uh, breakage of a stone and effective suction is the future and why it is future because such uh, time consuming methods of removing the stone are very very minimized very few fragments you need to take out the second puncture was uh, dilated and second puncture was uh, seen that again was effectively fragmented <coughs> you can see that uh, the stone is being fragmented and in front of your eyes it is like a morselation of the of the stone in front of your eyes the stone is getting fragmented completely and getting sucked out this patient had unapproachable this uh, calyx and a third puncture was required and uh, that also was dilated and you can see that uh, that uh, stone also is being completely cleared so uh, the advantage of uh, the shock pulse is that even though it's a agon stone because it works very fast uh, the suction can be very effective fragmentation is fast and therefore such a big stone can be created in the, can be completely cleared in the one stage and at the end you can see that these are the fragments which have been sucked out and uh, through the probe so that is how the shock pulse uh, can be used so we have used the shock pulse in more than about 280 cases since the time 4 to 5 years it is with us it can dust and suck the stones in mini park as well as the conventional pcnl bigger stones can be fragmented and sucked out uh, through the mini pcnl stagon stones can be done with the single stage and stone free rate is far more superior so that is what is our experience of a shock pulse thank you very much thank you sabnis for a wonderful talk and now we had um, um the shock pulse the trilogy um both and the pcnl um, uh, thing now we are going to the um, uh, neurotroscopy and uh, i invite uh, glenn preminger um because um, the same energy uh, the laser can be used in the kidney but problem is um, residual stone and sometimes residual stone can be as high as uh, uh, 50 or 60% so can we reduce it glenn Thank you Mahesh and also thanks to Dr. Sabinis for your invitation to be with you this evening. Uh here are my disclosures and I think we would all agree that the basic tenets of minimally invasive stone removal are simple access, efficient stone removal and ultimately complete excuse me efficient stone fragmentation and then ultimately complete stone removal. Uh well we've already mastered the um uh, easy access if you will for flexible ureteroscopy with the advent of the uh, ureteral access sheath uh and as you've already heard with the homium laser and now the tulium laser um we uh, have easy ways to fragment the stone uh and uh, with newer technologies such as the uh, moses effect that Dr. Gani so nicely presented and the super pulse tulium la laser that Dr. Chandra Munda uh presented um very nice ways uh that we can efficiently fragment the stone and create uh either small fragments or dust however i would argue that uh, our ways to remove the stone uh during flexible ureteroscopy are still lacking uh and uh, although the instrument companies have come up with a uh, new uh uh shaped baskets uh that improve uh stone removal uh i think we would all agree that basket extraction is a time consuming and tedious uh procedure with sub optimal stone free rates and has already been mentioned this this uh evening residual fragments are associated with upwards of a 50% rate of complications and stone events including pain or ed visits or rehospitalization of the patient so there remains a compelling need for a minimally invasive more efficient and more effective way to remove stone fragments after laser lithotripsy now suction uh with laser lithotripsy again is not new uh mahesh already has talked about um uh using uh suction uh during percutaneous stone removal uh and Jim Lingeman uh, and his group also uh, has have written about this and during ureteroscopy as early as 2003 uh 
um, the group from Marseille uh, was the first to talk about an automated irrigation and suction control system to facilitate stone removal during ureteroscopy. And since that time, uh, with the use of either a semi-rigid ureteroscope or with non-deflecting excess sheets, there have been, have been a number of investigators that have touted the use of suction after or during flexible ureteroscopy. The problem up to date has been that these access sheaths that had combined suction uh, are, are rigid and do not have the ability to um, deflect. Uh, so I'd like to talk uh, primarily about a steerable ureteroscopic renal evacuation system that we call the SURE system that uses the CVAC aspiration probe uh, to remove uh, fragments. And this CVAC device is a steerable vacuum aspiration system that uses suction and irrigation to more efficiently remove the fragments. And to, so once the fragment is removed, uh, we can pass the CVAC device into the collecting system and using fluoroscopic guidance, we can reach all portions of the collecting system to ensure a stone-free result. So basically what we're doing is uh, replacing the tr traditional one-by-one -one basketing of small fragments uh, using an irrigation and suction system uh, to evacuate the debris, uh, debris in a much more efficient fashion. Uh, so this steerable vacuum aspiration technology was developed specifically for ureteroscopy it has a large vacuum lumen of about 7.5 French to optimize the evacuation of stone fragments. This is a physician controlled on-demand irrigation and aspiration system. And again, using fluoroscopy, we can guide the uh, device into each of the calyces uh, and no direct visualization is required. Now I'd like to again thank Dr. Sabnis and Desai for allowing us to perform our first in human feasibility studies in Nadiad uh, just a, over a year ago. Uh, and these were in 17 patients who were randomized to CVAC or to basket extraction. There was no significant difference in the dem demographics of the patients or the stone volumes. However, it appeared on post um, hoc analysis that more CVAC patients had lower pole stones and that the pre-op stone volume was slightly higher in the CVAC group uh, than in the basket group. And our endpoints for this uh, first in human study, we're looking at the efficiency of, um, of, of stone uh, or the efficacy of stone removal, the efficiency of stone removal and as important, the safety of using this device. Now, this little video clip was taken uh, during one of the procedures and you can see the uh, CVAC device being used to suck out these small fragments that were created after stone fragmentation. Uh, and if we look um, at this post-op uh, picture, uh, here's the amount of debris that one can remove uh, quickly, usually in less than 10 minutes to remove all this debris uh, from the collecting system using the SURE procedure. Uh, and when we looked at our first in human data, uh, we found that the CVAC device uh, yielded more volume of stone removed um, uh, as compared to the basket. Uh, in addition, the rate of stone removal or the millimeters of stone removed per minute uh, was greater with the CVAC, CVAC device. And ultimately the stone free rate was superior with the CVAC, CVAC device on 30 days CT uh, than with basket extraction. We also found that the fluoroscopy time uh, between the cases where we used the CVAC device to navigate around the collecting system and plain basket extraction was essentially identical uh, and that there was uh, uh, even a learning curve that you could further reduce the fluoroscopy time uh, as you increase the number of cases performed. Uh, let me just share with you two cases. 
Uh, the first was in a 35-year-old male recurrent stone former uh, who had a BMI of 23 and a pre-op creatinine of 1.2. He had a mid-right ureteral calculus that measured about 10 by 7 millimeters in diameter. Uh, this stone had a Hounsfield density of 1,037. Uh, it was knocked, uh, it, uh, here's the stone uh, pre-op. Uh, during the procedure, we knocked it back up into the collecting system. We used standard uh, dusting and fragmentation settings. The total laser time about six minutes. The total time for stone removal was 23 minutes uh, and the procedure time uh, 65 minutes total with 200 millimeters or 200 uh, cc's of irrigation uh, used during the CVAC um, uh, suction and removal of the stone fragments. And the patient was uh, stone free on CT 30 days postoperatively. The second case in a 51 year old male with recurrent stones uh, who had undergone a right percutaneous stone removal a few years prior. Again, a relatively small patient uh, with a normal serum creatinine. Uh, he had two stones within the left lower pole calyx, uh, the largest measuring about nine by 11 millimeters in diameter. Uh, and we again used uh, the litho view uh, with standard dusting and fragmentation settings. Our total laser time about five and a half minutes. Our total, our total stone removal time also about five and a half minutes for a total procedure time of 30 minutes. Uh, and again, using uh, about 360 milliliters of fluid for the irrigation of the uh, stone fragments. Uh, and again, this patient uh, was found to be stone free uh, on his postoperative imaging. So with the SURE procedure using the CVAC uh, suction device, uh, we found that we could access all areas of the renal collecting system. There was no significant renal trauma and no significant increase in the fluoroscopy time. There appeared to be significantly higher percentage of stone removed uh, than basketing alone in less time. And this definitely appeared to be a more efficient method to clear the collecting system during flexible ureteroscopy. So I would say that uh, suction after ureteroscopy has definitive advantages with shorter operative times higher stone-free rates, reduced complications, and potentially fewer returns to the ED and lower retreatment rates. Again, thanks to Dr. Savnis and Desai for allowing me to participate in this uh, very interesting symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. It is um, the first time um, uh, we have tried to use a suction into the kidney to um, um, uh, to clear the stone. And um, I would like you, uh, um, uh, Shashank is going to present the few more cases at the end. Probably we would like to have the comments on that. Thank you so much. Now I will ask uh, Mihir uh, to speak about the, uh, his innovation, his and uh, uh, Jenny Langman's uh, innovation of uh, uh, urotoscopic assisted mini PCNL as a suction. Mihir? Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, it's been very interesting listening to um, all the recent uh, advances in, in fragmentation aspiration technologies. And especially for me, because it's been about 10 years since I, in my practice, have managed stone disease. Uh, I haven't treated a stone clinically since I left uh, Cleveland. Uh, and yet, uh, just the technology aspect of it is exciting for me. And uh, this was a part of uh, my involvement with uh, uh, robotic platforms to treat uh, stone disease that led to this uh, study that I would uh, like to present. Uh, Jamie Landman and I uh, were the uh, co-PIs in this, this study. And just as a disclosure, uh, I'm a consultant to Oris Health, which is the, the company that uh, I'll be talking about that made some of these devices. And the study was also fu funded uh, by Oris. 
the study was performed at Nadiad, uh, and uh, again, would like to thank the entire team at MPUH uh, for once again being able to organize uh, in a very efficient manner uh, a study designed for, for stone management evaluation. Just off the bat, I'd like to clarify that this technology and device is not meant to be a clinical system. This was a intermediate step in verifying uh, the, the feasibility and efficiency of two critical components of, uh, of an eventual robotic system um, uh, in treatment of stones. So the idea was to develop a steerable percutaneous catheter that would uh, allow for us to do simultaneous uh, stone aspiration while the ureteroscopic system was doing fragmentation. So it adds a percutaneous access sheath, uh, a percutaneous access uh, to the, the procedure, uh, but the, the, the three was, uh, and hypothesis was that it allows for uh, a greater efficiency in fragment aspiration. Uh, so the two specific devices that were used uh, was, one was a, was a dedicated fluid uh, management tower uh, because there is a, an increased degree of complexity to ensuring uh, that you have adequate amount of irrigation without over distending the system, but also provide adequate suctioning for aspiration of the fragments. And also there was this percutaneous suction catheter and irrigation sheath uh, that allowed for uh, uh, the, the, the stone, stone as well as fluid aspiration. Uh, otherwise there was standard endourological equipment. The, the lithoview was used as the, as the ureteroscope and a low powered laser, uh, homium laser were used for, for stone lithotripsy. But the ultimate goal of this procedure is to roboticize the ureteroscopic and the PCNL components of catheter control uh, and also provide a more automated electromagnetic guided system for percutaneous access so that at least uh, the, the, the roadblock of, of doing something percutaneously in the community in folks who are, are not formally trained for perk access you know, can be achieved. So that's the ultimate commercial system that hopefully will be available next year. Uh, but we just tested out these two uh, components in a manual setting uh, uh, for this uh, study. Uh, and what, what's the rationale of, of using, you've all seen uh, in today's symposium that there are multiple percutaneous devices that can be used in a mini PCNL setting and there are mini PCNL sheets available that allow for um, uh, suction uh, during the procedure. But the idea of having a dedicated aspiration percutaneous channel is that the entire uh, internal diameter of this 14 French uh, catheter is available for aspiration of fragments. So theoretically, you should get more efficient uh, uh, aspiration, even with a slightly larger uh, fragment diameter. Uh, the fact that this catheter is flexible and steerable um, allows us to access most calices simultaneously under vision because the vision is being uh, uh, provided retrograde by the ureteroscope. So by deconstructing the optics as well as fragmentation aspects to the retrograde axis, which typically is obtained for most PCNLs anyways, uh, you, are allow, you are able to use the real estate of the percutaneous component for a fragment aspiration. And, and as I mentioned that uh, whenever you have a high, uh, a high uh, uh, flow aspiration through a large bore uh, percutaneous catheter, uh, the, the, the irrigation system has to be more sophisticated that allows for visualization. And in this case, uh, and I'll show you later, uh, the, the, the irrigation inflow was through the space between the uh, rigid outer sheath and the flexible percutaneous catheter, as well as through the ureteroscope. Um, uh, and also this system needs to have enough inflow that prevents collapse of the system when you're uh, aspirating through a large bore catheter. Uh, this was a phase one study, so primary intent was just feasibility and looking at uh, also adverse events, uh, whether we needed to convert to conventional PCNL procedure time, as well as the stone-free rates based on immediate post-operative CT scans. And, and so this is again how the system is set up. There is a rigid um, uh, percutaneous sheath, which is a, a 16 French uh, a sheath uh, inner diameter through which a 14 French steerable percutaneous catheter is passed in. So the inflow of irrigation is in the space between the sheath and the catheter. Uh, to dis the, and the primary uh, purpose of this inflow is to keep the, the, the collecting system at optimal states of distension, uh, while the inflow through the ureteroscope is basically to provide visualization at the uh, procedure and lithotripsy site. Uh, and then 
aspiration is uh, carried out through the inner lumen of this percutaneous steerable catheter through which stones are aspirated and 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 it is managed by this uh, fluidics uh, system uh, inclusion criteria included the renal stones between 1 and 2.5 cm in size and standard exclusions uh, for performing uh, stone procedures uh, including active urinary tract infections medical comorbidities uh, uh, abnormal anatomy and structures uh, uh, were were available uh, the procedure was done uh, in a modified supine lithotomy position which is what we uh, anticipate will happen with the robotic procedure standard retrograde ureteroscopic access was obtained using an access sheath and the lithoview scope um, supine uh, percutaneous access was obtained through a desired calyx uh, the outer sheath is 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 actually kept stable by a, a bed mounted arm and then through that a, a uh, the manually defectable aspiration sheath is then introduced and this is the or setup and of course because of this this procedure is manual it requires two surgeons one performing the ureteroscopic procedure and the other one controlling the percutaneous aspiration sheath but the since the visualization was only retrograde there was just one um, a camera system that was required for this uh, this is a short video of the procedure just to show you the ergonomics and this is the intrarenal collecting system you can see that this is you know excellent optics this was a soft stone and uh, even using a low power uh, laser as the fragmentation starts you can see that the the fragments are immediately uh, um, aspirated uh, part of the uh, advantage of suction on the percutaneous catheter is it also keeps the stone fairly uh, static and less prone to moving around because of the suction um, uh, and, and so the, in fact we also used the the percutaneous catheter to relocate stones to get it into uh, a, a a desired location for fragmentation and uh, during uh, uh, the dusting process the you can see that there is immediate evacuation of fragments there is not a dust storm that you could typically see uh, during stone fragmentation because the flow uh, is going away from the ureteroscope towards the uh, percutaneous catheter and the 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 percutaneous catheter tip is reinforced to be laser resistant and as you can see here even bigger fragments are aspirated because there is no competing uh, 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 instrument going through this percutaneous sheath so the entire sheath lumen is available for for aspiration of these fragments uh, even the effect of suction to keep it mobile is increases as the stone becomes smaller and so as you can see here this is you can get complete uh, clearance and one thing that was subjectively uh, very clear is that the amount of debris and dust that you typically see stuck to the mucosa is also is also not present uh, these uh, patients had standard workup but most importantly each case of these 10 patients was evaluated by a, a thin slice uh, a ct uh, at the at the just prior to discharge to evaluate immediate post procedure uh, stone clearance and then follow up ct urograms were performed to again uh, rule out stricture anatomic damage and 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 stone free rate this is kind of the demographics uh, standard average age being 42 the average stone size was 2 cm um, uh, uh, the upper limit was about just above the uh, 2.5 cm point now uh, technically all procedures were successful uh, we did not have to convert to uh, um, a conventional pcnl or 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 standard ureteroscopy and and retrograde extraction uh, there were no device related events that we found one patient had a mild uh, uh, flank in uh, positional injury and, and three patients had fevers without any associated urinary tract infection the average procedure time even with this manual procedure of course having two surgeons in play was just about one hour uh, and uh, as we'll see the stone free rate prior to discharge was 70 percent three patients had residual stone fragments again much smaller than their original stone uh, diameters and and one patient had a 2.3 millimeter residual fragment at the 30 day mark so the 30 day ct uh, stone clearance rate was 90 percent this is again one example two stones 10 and 5 millimeters each and uh, this was a residual fragment at the at the immediate post-op visit and then there was no stone uh, seen at the at the one month visit uh, some some uh, aspects um, uh, you know uh, that we found is that there is clearly an immediate aspiration of the dust now the the vacuum effect of keeping the stone mobile though 
is inconsistent and that's primarily because of the shape uh, variability in stones and so if the stone is of of a very uh, speculated uh, surface then the 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 device will not be able to manually relocate it but certainly you get a good amount of flow going towards it and, and the uh, the stone fragments uh, get aspirated prior to they have before they have a chance to get retropulsed uh, the other issue obviously is energy sources have improved as we saw in today's symposium uh, things like the high powered uh, homium lasers thulium laser and other uh, uh, smaller caliber uh, lithotripsy devices may actually improve the efficiency of the dusting and extraction process uh, also uh, the the fluid aspiration system even though we had an automated system there are additional um, uh, controls for example uh, to increase the flow automatically once suction is started etc that are being incorporated and, and again patient positioning to avoid injuries etc and, and improve workflow uh, is also being refined so to summarize uh, in this phase 1 study we demonstrated the feasibility of uh, 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 the ORIS system for producing a PCNL uh, again with manual instrumentation and uh, again to reiterate this is not the intended a commercial product, but just to uh, uh, basically validate two essential components of the eventual robotic platform, which is the percutaneous catheter as well as the irrigation fluid system. Uh, the procedure time and stone free rates, even in the manual setting, were encouraging. And, and so uh, the next phase is currently ongoing, and hopefully, we should have some uh, 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 clinical data on the robotic system uh, within a year's time frame. Again, uh, thank you so much for. Uh, the the opportunity and again thank you to the the team at MPUH and Adyar for uh, you know making this uh, th this this study possible. Thank you, Mir. So, what is the progress on this um, device? Uh, this device is being currently uh, validated. The robotic, uh, the entire thing is now robotic, and and hopefully uh, uh, there will be some uh, a, a clinical activity uh, next year. Uh, this now company has been acquired by Johnson and Johnson. And so, um, you know, again, there are some aspects to this uh, that we, we are not totally uh, available to us, but uh, hopefully, uh, but, the, but the pathway to development is ongoing. There's so one question to you from Akshan Athani uh, is, did you face regarding the recurrent blockage of the suction catheter? Yeah, so that's a, a very good question. We did not see any blockage of the tube. So that was one of the things that we were trying to look at. And I think the fact that there is a, a, an effective suction element to a large bore tube helps with that process. So uh, again, the next phase study, we are also looking at studying stone fragments uh, so that uh, um, uh, uh, size, so that to see what's the largest fragment, but it does appear that you can even get up to uh, six, seven millimeter fragments uh, through this uh, through this device. Thank you, Meir. Um, Glenn, you have one question from Akshay Nathani, whether, uh, you are using the suction blindly, though under fluoroscopy. Did you had any mucosal injury because of the suction? Well, uh, thank you, Mahesh. We were uh, specifically uh, interested in this because uh, of the concern for potential damage. And the, uh, we found that when we inspected the collecting system, uh, both uh, after the suction with the CVAC device and with the basketing, that the degree of um, a trauma to the collecting system was identical. There was really just minimal ecchymosis, uh, and, um, but no perforations, uh, no large uh, defects in the mucosa. So no significant damage. Was there, was there any vacuum pressure uh, calibrated? You know, uh, we the... didn't, we, yeah, we didn't calibrate it. We just used standard we use standard suction from uh, that was available in the operating room. Uh, and um, uh, the suction is controlled by the surgeon. So it's not a prolonged suction. You, you have to irrigate and then uh, almost immediately suck after that or suck while you're irrigating. Uh, and so that prevents uh, the, uh, the uh, mm -hmm. mucosa essentially from coming in contact with the tip of the suction device. So now we are going to have a four presentation of five minute age. And um, we would like you to 
uh, ask question or pass a comment on this uh, uh, experiment which we have done. So now I'll invite uh, Navin, uh, Dr. Navin, uh, to present uh, his work on uh, on the homium with Moses technology. This section, Navin. Okay, let me. Ah, uh, Navin, what up? Uh, okay. Shashank. Navin, can you make your presentation, please? Who is presenting? Navin, you are presenting or Shashank? Sir, Navin is presenting, sir. Okay. So make full screen. We can see your uh, uh, first slide. Make full screen and start. Yes, yes sir. Yeah, please, go, please go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good evening and good morning. Happy Father's Day. And it actually is a true Father's Day for urology with having two of the true fathers of modern urology with Dr. Mahesh Desai, sir, and Dr. Glenn Preminger with us. I'm going to present in brief about... Full, full screen, full screen. Okay, sir. So I'm going to present in brief about MPH experience of mini PCNL with suction with MOSIS laser technology. I'm Dr. Navin Kumar Reddy, urology resident at MPH. How am I going to present? So initially I'm going to present in brief about the materials and methods, the instruments used, the laser machine, and something about suction. One representative case with procedural video, and then I'm going to present about the fragment analysis. We studied 110 patients with stones up to three centimeter. After the procedure, stone fragments of, for each laser setting were independently retrieved and segregated according to the size of less than one, one to three, and more than three mm, and then weighed. The optimal laser settings for dusting was then analyzed among different stone density groups. CT scan imaging was performed in all the patients with 48 hours and at 30 days, if at all, there were initial residual stone fragments. Stone free rate was defined as no residual fragments on CT imaging. So this is, these are the instruments we used. This is a 12 French nephroscope, which is uh, passed through the sheet. And this is an 18 French clear putter nephrosomy suction sheet. So this is a red mark, which is which indicates the point until where the nephroscope has to be withdrawn for suctioning the larger fragments. The oblique offset uh, has a pressure vent, which can be used to control the suction pressure. This is the MOSIS uh, mission, which is 120 watts, which we used. And we used 365 microns laser fiber. So in this image, we can clearly see uh, the nephrostomy sheet and the nephroscope within it. So when we are suctioning, when we are lasing, we have the space between the nephroscope and the sheet. Sorry. So we have the space between the, nep the nephroscope and the sheet. So thus, this space of six frames, which would mean two mm, uh, would allow fragments up to two mm to be simultaneously suctioned out during lasing of the stone. And if there are larger fragments formed up to six mm, the nephroscope can be just pulled out so that the larger fragments can be uh, suctioned out. So this is a suction uh, uh, tube which is attached and we uh, kept the pressure at around 150 to 200 millimeter of mercury. So the stone fragments which are uh, collected will get collected in this uh, bottle. After the procedure, this bottle uh, uh, will be taken and the stones are dried and then they are segregated uh, like this uh, into less than 1, 1 to 3 and more than 3 mm and then they are weighed and then analyzed. So uh, coming to an example, we, uh, we had uh, a case of 33-year-old man who came with right flank pain. He had a 28.8 mm uh, largest dimension stone in the right uh, kidney, which was uh, having 1,527 HU. So it was actually a crossed fused ectopic kidney. Yeah, so we also did 3D reconstruction to see for the proper anatomy of the uh, kidney. So we took the patient for mini PCNL. Patient was in prone position and under ultrasound guidance, puncture was made into the middle calyx and suction tube was attached after passing the clear pressure sheet. And with the help of 12 French Wolf nephroscope, the stone was visualized. And we can see the active suction, which is coming through the tube. We started the lasing with 0.3 joules and 40 hertz. And in six minutes, we could uh, 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 lase the stone. And we can see uh, that 47.6% of the fragments, which was uh, made, was dust. 
and we slowly increase the energy settings to 0.4 joules and 40 hertz and we, and we did it for four minutes for seven minutes and also saw the fragment size so as we increase the uh, laser frequency we could see actually the fragments with between one to three mm were actually more but less than three mm fragments overall were around 90 percent so then we increase the energy and decrease the frequency uh, 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 to laser stone. So in, in, in this uh, video, we can clearly see uh, the stone uh, dust, the dust being formed, and it is actually simultaneously suctioned out uh, through the uh, space between the nephroscope and the sheath. So because of which the vision gets cleared instantaneously. So here we can see as we use 0.5 joules and 50 hertz, we, we got 80% of the uh, stone fragments were dust actually. And so uh, similarly, we increase the frequency uh, to 60 hertz and we could see 78.6% to be completely dust. And then uh, we increase the energy setting to 0.6 joules and 60 hertz by which time the stone was actually small enough. So it was actually breaking down into, into larger fragments. So as the larger fragments were being formed, uh, the nephroscope was withdrawn uh, so that the small stone fragments will get um, suctioned out and get out from the oblique side port. So this can be seen in the uh, video. So this is a small fragment which are being formed. And as the small fragments are being formed, we are just pulling out the nephroscope out so that those fragments will automatically come out and get suctioned out. So it was complete clearance on both nephroscopy and fluoroscopy. We only placed a PCN tube and there was no uh, uh, digestant. So we analyzed all the fragments. Uh, uh, so after each laser setting, we actually collected those those laser those fragments separately. So here we can see initially from 0.3 joules to 60 hertz, we started from this energy and then ended up with around 0.6 joules. Mm, so we weighed we we segregated the stone fragments into less than one, one to three, and more than three mm, and weighed them to see for the percentage of the dust and percentage of the larger fragments. So overall, we can see that most in all the settings dust was inevitable and in the settings between 0.4 joules and 0.5 joules and between 40 to 60 hertz we could see the maximum amount of dust between 70 to 80 percent and we had the stone fragmentation rate of 3.6 millimeter cube per second and we had the largest fragment of 4 mm uh, the total energy utilized was 76.4 kilojoules and the total lasing time was 55 minutes so this is the total picture where we can see the 75 percent of the stone fragments were dust, so which was being simultaneously suctioned out through the space between the sheet and between the scope. Post-operative CT uh, within 48 hours showed complete clearance without any residual fragments. So I will present brief uh, results. Uh, so here we we actually uh, uh, use single energy setting in 93 cases, and we used uh, multiple energy settings in 17 cases. And we analyzed all the stone fragments, which we had done in 110 patients, uh, where we had uh, uh, optimal laser settings were actually uh, found out. So after the stones were uh, fragmented and, uh, and analyzed, we sent them for analysis. And, uh, and according to the stone composition, we under stone density, we found out the, the optimal laser settings for a particular group of stone density. So here, less than 1,000 group of uh, uh, stones um, can be broken up uh, uh, with maximum dust with the help of 0.4 joules and 50 hertz. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and for stones which are more than 1,400 HU uh, with 0.5 joules and 60 hertz, uh, the dusting was maximum. So uh, if we break up the stone location according, accordingly, we had maximum stones of pelvic stones and, and the and next followed by the stones in the lower calyx. So in all the patients uh, at 48 hours, we had stone free rate of around 75 to 80 to 85 percent. At, at one month uh, CT scan, all patients had completely uh, clear with of stones. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we can see here that most of our patients, all of our patients had maximum of more of less than 3 mm fragments and more than 3 mm fragments were only 25% when considering all the patients together. So to, to sum up, for stones which are less than 1000 HU, energy settings uh, were uh, with the optimum energy settings of 0.4 joules and 50 hertz would give maximum dose of 75 and 1000 to 1400 HU stones with 0.5 joules and 50 hertz we could uh, get maximum dust of 72.7% and similarly for more than 1400 HU 0.5 joules and 60 hertz gave 78.6% uh, maximum dust so overall for any stone for any stone density uh, we can tell that 0.4 joules to 0.5 joules and 40 to 60 hertz gave us maximum dusting of around 70 to 80 percent and all the patients had complete clearance at one month follow-up thank you thank you Naveen.
um, uh, Khushid uh, would like to have your comment and suggestion. Yeah, I, I th this is a very useful data set that you have done here, Mahesh, because you know we, we don't have clinical uh, information on how much we're able to disintegrate stones in different percentage uh, fragment categories. So um, I'm hearing the message that around 75% you're getting of, uh, of fragments that are less than one millimeter with your technique. Uh, and then the rest are, are chunks depending. So based on what I've seen, are you saying that the best setting that you've seen is around 0 0.4 joules with the higher hertz? Yes. 0 0.4 and uh, 50 um, frequency, but 0 0.5, depending upon the Hans unit. But this is where we got the, the best uh, fragmentation, though analysis was done afterward, but we, we went only on the Hans full unit. Question is, um, is there a way? Because yesterday we were talking and then you talked about the, the, the distance um, between the stone where you can have a more dust rather than a fragment. Yeah, I, I think, you know, especially with the, the Moses uh, uh, mode of distance mode, if you're one millimeter off, you, you can get maybe finer ablation, but you must be, be conscious that that will lead to slightly slower fragmentation in terms of breakdown time, you know, because the, the, the rate of fragmentation is lower the further distance you have from the kidney. But I think the quality of fragmentation might be better. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm interested when I heard uh, Dr. Krambeck speak with her comparison between shock pulse and, well, trilogy. And she said that with the trilogy, there was constant suction with, and with, um, the shock pulse, she didn't feel that. So I'm curious, just to, uh, since we're on this discussion around fragment size and suction, maybe uh, Dr. Krambeck could just, a really nice talk. So Amy, the you, they're both sucking, right? Both devices are sucking, but why does the trilogy, when you say it sucks, uh, just, you know, make, teach me about that. Yeah, um, so with the shock pulse and the trilogy, for some reason, we're, it may be that the trilogy is making smaller fragments, but we're not really seeing that. We're seeing actually quite large fragments, um, but the suction seems to be more continuous and more steady. So, you know, one of our major problems with the uh, shock pulse was the malfunctions, and most of the time the malfunctions were, was clogging of the tubing. So, uh, and we'd have to stop and clear the suction clogs. So I don't know if it's the force of suction that the trilogy is creating or if the fragments are slightly smaller. But I think Dr. Desai's uh, comparison where he is um, actually measuring the fragment sizes, that may give us an answer to this. And so that me, on, me. Just on that note, this clogging, right? Clogging is going to be the enemy of any of all the devices in this space for us to try and get complete clearance. And so, um, did you see any clogging, Mahesh, with your technique with the with the with the Cleopatra? Did you get no. any clogging with this with the sheath? No. If uh, if the stone fragment is large, uh, little large, you know, it, it chips comes out, and sometimes it goes into the tube where you can get a uh, little uh, 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 stuck but otherwise uh, there is a there is a on the on that offshoot there is a vent where you can put a thumb and you can increase the suction and when you open up the suction decreases so you can always um, play with the 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 power of the suction so um, that because sometimes the suction is powerful the pelvis may collapse and then um, you know, there is no space so you can um, you can what about uh, Dr. Preminger? I, yeah, I was going to ask Dr. Preminger, did, did you get, see any clogging with the CVAC? First, should I agree with you that that clogging is, is uh, we consider that to be a real uh, potential problem. Uh, but I can say that we, we, have, we didn't experience it, at least not in our initial trial, uh, nor on the bench did we see it as a major issue. Um, interestingly, uh, back about 20 some odd years ago, uh, when we, uh, the lithoclast first came out, um, the uh, EMS uh, just had a hollow metal tube 
that they put around the lithoclast and we started using that um, clinically uh, and found that the major problem was clogging, that the fragments would get stuck between the pneumatic probe and inside the metal sheath. And it wasn't until they added the ultrasound uh, for the, to the sheath itself that you could further fragment the stones inside the device that the second generation uh, lithoclast uh, came out and, and that really made a big difference. But we didn't see clogging with the CVAC device. I, I, we were actually uh, quite pleased with that. If I, can, if I can tell that shock pulse when we are using, uh, quite often you get a blockage of the uh, suction probe, blockage of the tubing. And during the procedure, often, uh, especially when you are doing a bigger stone, uh, you have to intermittently, in fact, disconnect everything, dismantle everything, clear up the probe, and then uh, reconnect and then start using uh, uh, again. The moment you get the uh, probe which is blocked, the noise uh, suddenly changes and you realize that actually it is not getting sucked out. From the noise itself, uh, you can make out. So this is a big problem which uh, uh, we face uh, often. Okay, I think um, we, will, we will go to the next uh, presentation because the discussion will continue. Um, Darshit is going to talk about the um, uh, thulium uh, disintegration with suction. Now, Kurshit will, uh, you see the difference between the two. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead. Now. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh Desai, sir, and Dr. Sabnish, sir, for providing me this opportunity. I am sharing our experience of the thulium fiber laser in mini park to dust with the suction. So, uh, my talk is divided into three parts. First of all, I have introduction. Introduction of the thulium fiber laser is very well given by the Dr. Chandra Mohan, sir. And then how we started this uh, thulium fiber laser in mini park and then our experience. So, we have done totally 54 cases of mini PCNL with suction and thulium fiber laser in renal stone of less than 3 cm. And um, uh, we used 12 French nephroscope and the 18 French clear petra sheet and 18 French char super per sheet. All this uh, physics is already described by the Dr. Mahesh Desai sir and Dr. Navin Reddy. So to have a better idea of the laser setting for the stone dusting, we performed a pilot study of the 10 patient where we started with the energy of 0.1 joule and 100 hertz and slowly increased the frequency and keeping the energy low. By this method, we can maximize the dust. So we collect and after which we collected the stone fragments for each laser setting and analyzed the stone fragment by sewing them. We narrowed down our laser setting in which we had majority of the dusting, which is less than one mm. And X-ray and the CT scan imaging was performed in all patients within the 48 hours and in residual stone after the 30 days to assess the stone clearance. So uh, we, have used, uh, we have used IPG photonics uh, thulium fiber laser machine with the 400 micron laser fiber. So here I am representing the three cases. In first case, we have this is a 60-year-old male with right side renal pelvis scale and uh, stone household urine is 1,500. So uh, we use total three energy setting in which uh, USD guided lower calatial puncture was made. USD guided lower calatial puncture was made. Clear petra sheet is inserted, instruction is attached. So first of all, we started with the 0.1 into 200 hertz. So we can see that the stone is not getting dusted or not, nor it is getting fragmented. So after which we have uh, turned our the uh, increases the frequency, but by increasing the, our frequency, uh, we even not get that the uh, dusting with that which we required in for the stone. And then after which we have done the 0.2 under 200 by keeping the uh, energy slightly uh, by keeping the joule slightly increase in the energy of 200 hertz, we can clearly see that the stone is getting dusted and fragmented. So uh, this is the moment of the uh, scope uh, and this is the red mark where we can see that the uh, fragments are coming out. 
so by which uh, we uh, we can get 45% of the 6 45 6 45.6% of the less than 1 mm and post op there is a complete clearance of the stone in uh, second case which is a 50 year old male with left side pelvis scale or a household urinal 1500 in which uh, we have used very high frequency by using high frequency we can see that the stone is not getting dusted but it is getting fragmented so in which we we derived 40.7 percent which is maximum more than 3 mm so by this our doing this study we we after which we considered that this is the last case we have done 53 year old female which is at the right side pelvis and the lower calcial cal in which we have done uh, we use this 0.15 to 200 hertz So uh, we can here see that the stone is uh, effectively getting busted. And uh, simultaneously there is a suction so that there is a, a vision is also clear. We can see the dust which is coming out of the uh, suction tube. And dust is getting collected in the bottle. And simultaneously, fragments are sucked out. So, uh, this is uh, by which we can get maximum of the dust less than 1 mm, which is the CU which is used in our study. So, post op, there is a complete clearance. Uh, so, in our uh, so in our total 54 of the cases, stone size diameter is mean is 18.32 uh, mm, and stone density was 1300. Uh, total lasing time was uh, 600 and stone fragmentation rate is 5.02. So uh, in each our study, we get the less than 1 mm is approximately 50%. And uh, we have done uh, approximately 40% of the cases in the total tubeless manner. On day 2, there is a we get the 65% of the patient as a complete clearance and the day 30, 100% there is a stone clearance. So uh, by doing this, uh, we can uh, derive that with optimization of the HU in the less than 1000 uh, Hounsfield unit group, we have, if we use 0.2 and, and uh, frequency of 125 to 150, we get 92% of the dust. And by with 1000 to 400, by using energy of 0.2 and frequency of 150, between, between the 150 and 200, we get 91 of the dust. And if uh, more than uh, 1400, then uh, if we use energy of 0.2 and frequency of 200, then we get 91 of 91% of the dust. So what we experience is thulium fiber laser is safe and efficient to break the kidney stone in vivo. And we have proposed the laser setting, which I have already described in the previous uh, slide, according to the household unit to maximize the dusting. And the new concept of dusting and suction simultaneously, we can clearly see that the, there is a they can decrease the operative time, less stone fragments, so that there is a less chances of recurrence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dashit. Um, Chandraman? Yes, sir. Uh, what is uh, your um, uh, comment sir, on the sir, settings? I have a couple of questions, sir, actually. Is the laser fiber used is the same in all cases? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, what is the size of the laser fiber? 400. I think we, we use the 400. 400 microns, sir. 400. Because we eventually we wanted to compare the both the, together. So 365 and 400. So you change the settings uh, whenever the HU units uh, are uh, are changed, you will change the settings in all the cases. Specific settings only will be used from the beginning. Yeah. No, dep depending upon the fragmentation, we, we found that this was the best settings which we had, which we could fragment. What we are looking at the dust, how much yes, dust we can create. So, uh, sir, so what is your setting? The aim of the study in future, what is in your mind, sir? Is it the, you want to make that dust as much in PCNL also? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. okay then, because you are using a suction. Yes, uh, so I would like to make a dust so that I don't use a forcep or a, any other means to do that. So, okay. so what is the, the best setting which we get? And then eventually, uh, I still feel point two uh, joules and uh, uh, the hundred is one of the best settings. Average thousand HU, sir. Point uh, five and hundred, is it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, but we find that that probably causes a more fragmentation uh, yes, rather than dusting. You know, 
but okay. still our is only 54 we would like to do more cases um, okay. to to um right. like push it push it very nice work and again congratulations for doing these studies uh, i think you you have data that nobody else has right now in terms of comparing laser settings different energy modalities in terms of thulium fiber and the moses and fragmentation so when i saw your data with the thulium you were showing me only 45% of fragments are less than yeah. one millimeter yeah. is, is that correct yes darshit so yeah for the so, did, so have you compared the two the two modalities have you next, seen any next, next paper next paper is, okay so but you're not so you're not getting 70 because you were getting 75% less than 1 mm with the moses settings is that correct yes but we have you know we have done 110 cases here we could not get that we were trying to look for the proper setting here we find that increasing the frequency gives you more dusting rather than increasing the energy and then the other thing about the thulium fiber is it you can take it down to very low very low um, pulse energy settings right 0 0.02 and and very high hertz did you find that th those settings that you didn't find those settings were helpful um no i think for, for, for initially we did a very low 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 setting and but then we have to increase the frequency so first we we increase we went into 200 300 sometime 500 to see which is the one which will be give us the the best settings so at the moment what we found that um, uh, that the so these three settings, which has been um, uh, suggested, is the one which has given us the maximum dusting. And I'm, I'm seeing that's 0 0.2 joules and 200. That's right. And, uh, you know, in, in um, um, but we what we find with um, the thulium is uh, sometimes when we're using it, when we increase the frequency, sometimes there is a spark. You see lots of spark, and then um, uh, you have to wait till um, you know. And then, of course, it, it breaks. But um, um, the spark. How? how uh, um, Chandra Mohan, how do you avoid sparking? No, I have not. He uh, Sir, any any uh, increased energy unnecessarily, and second thing is very hard stone. Uh, uh, if you touch constantly. Uh, that uh, sparkling as well as the blackening of the stone happens. This happens with calcium oxalate monohydrate with very high energy. That is my observation, sir. Yeah, we we try to avoid to touch the stone. You know, we just keep it little little away so that yes. you know you know it, it gets past. Okay, the next paper Abhijit is going to do the comparison of the retrospective comparison of the thulium and the Moses. Uh, probably you know that would be the giving us the idea. Abhijit? Hello, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, sir, for this uh, opportunity. While it's a pleasure uh, talking with the two giants of stone management, sir, and then I would be presenting a retrospective analysis about uh, these two energies which we have in uh, market which is holmium high power holmium laser with Moses technology and a thulium fiber laser and the aim being the dusting. So I have no disclosures. <clears throat> so this is our experience uh, of uh, luminous uh, holmium 120 watts versus a super pulse IPJ photonic 60 watt machine. And to in short, uh, to tell about the differences, it is uh, holmium is a flash based and thulium fiber is a laser diode based. Uh, as uh, uh, Chandramon sir said that we can achieve very low frequencies, I mean very low energies and high frequencies with thulium. And uh, the, there is obviously some weight difference between the, these two machines and between the energy efficiencies of these two machines. So present, coming on to our uh, experience, uh, we tried to evaluate both energy in a single patient. So this patient had presented to us with the bilateral obstructing stones for which uh, he, was, he was diverted with the PCN. And then uh, we tried to evaluate each side with a different uh, setting, a different energy source. So on the left side, 
uh, this is a, this side is being operated by a moses uh, technology and the other side is being operated by tulium fiber laser the, the uh, stone on this side is almost uh, 1000 hu and this side is also 1000 hu the 21 by 21 mm stone and this is 13.7 words into 8.2 mm stone so coming on to the moses technology uh, here we can see how fine the dust is being formed and uh, addition of the suction probably leads to a very clear vision and uh, uh, achieves a maximum stone clearance and uh, increases the rate of stone ablation and coming on to this side of tulium here also we can see how fine the dust is being formed and addition of the suction here has also led to uh, faster uh, ablations of the stone and decreasing the operative times we can see in this uh, side the total laser time was uh, 5 minutes on this side on the tulium side it was 4 minutes so this slide shows a side by side comparison of both the technologies these uh, technologies uh, though are new in the market uh, there have been many in vitro trials but there is a lack of in human or in vivo trials comparing both of them so here we can see both the technologies uh, being on the same patient on the two sides simultaneously and then uh, if this patient required three punctures we completely cleared of the stone this side also we had a complete stone clearance uh, with a single puncture and at the end we achieved a complete stone clearance on both sides so especially this slide is only pertinent to this patient and uh, as we can see the tulium led to 46% of uh, more than 3 mm uh, fragments while it led to 22 and moses led to 64% but uh, this was just in one patient so we tried to uh, do a retrospective analysis from august 2018 to december 2019 the inclusion criteria were less than 2.5 cm stones they the the patient sample size was 108 it was divided into 54 patient in moses arm and 54 patient in the tulium arm and the parameters that we assessed for the laser time operative time stone fragment distribution as can be seen here the complications and the stone free rate at 48 hours and at 1 month so we use a 12 uh, french nephroscope with a 18 french clear petra sheet or superpuff sheet and then uh, we concluded that uh, both the energies are safe and efficient and uh, uh, they are almost equal uh, stone fragment distribution in both of them and equal stone free rates in both of them and the limitation of the study was it was a retrospective analysis we have started a prospective randomized control trial and uh, we have just started acquiring the patients and this is how we sieved the uh, stones as has been shown already by uh, this is sir and then this is how the three more than 3 mm fragment 1 to 3 mm fragment and finally this was the does what we were interested in and then we finally weighed it and then measured it so now to analyze our data what we did is we divided the stones we had into three groups less than 1100 hu 1100 to 1350 hu and more than 1350 hu we divided this into three groups so that we were equivalent we comparable in the pre operative parameters so in this less than 1000 1100 hu what we found is that the total laser time total operative time was comparable the stone dusting is can be seen it is almost 45% and 54% in uh, both the arms which is comparable though if we see the complete stone fragment uh, majority is, is the dust what is 45% moses arm 54% in the tulium arm coming on to the mid group which was 1100 to 1350 hu the pre operative parameters being comparable uh, the uh, stone fragment distribution was Uh, in uh, tulium arm it was 53 versus in uh, moses arm it was 39 in 1 to 3 mm it was 34 in moses versus 13 in tulium arm so it was uh, though it was significant but i think this was just uh, observation that was seen in more than 1350 hu uh, 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 the pre operative uh, parameters uh, uh, were comparable and then, and then we see, when we see uh, the fragment uh, the distribution, distribution it was 46% in the moses arm versus 36% in the tulium arm 
and, and uh, uh, VCC, VCC focused is focused on the more than 3 mm fragments, fragments. It, was it was more in the Thulia ma'am. Ma. So, so we didn't, didn't have any reason uh, as, to, as to why this was happening, but this was, but this was a retrospective analysis. And uh, uh, we, to answer this, we have started a prospective randomized control trial to this. Coming on to uh, the outcomes, the stone free rate at 48 hours with Moses was around 77% and with William it was 64%. And this itself proves that this stone clearance at 48 hours is just because of the technique. So this dusting along with the suction uh, it leads to maximum stone clearance at 48 hours and then whatever we achieve at one month it was 100% and then the, it was probably because of the passing of the stones. We had three complications in, in both each uh, group, uh, which uh, was just UTI. But though in uh, Thulium, um, we found that it was a high energy and it uh, sparked uh, quite a some time. So to uh, give some highlight on what is the in vitro studies being done. So this is an in vitro study of high power holmium laser versus Thulium fiber. So they concluded that these preliminary studies demonstrate that Thulium fiber is pro pro promising alternative for lithotripsy when operating in dusting mode producing higher stone ablation rates and smaller fragments, though this was an in vitro study and clinical studies are warranted. Then coming on to the temperature, as uh, uh, Chandra Mohan sir said, this is a study by Oliver Trax and Drogos group. And they, they, they showed that the use of both the laser, thulium laser as well as high power laser, had uh, similar temperature changes for all treatment settings. Coming to this only in vitro paper, which compares Moses, versus thulium uh, for dusting efficiency, which they said as thulium produced twice as much uh, stone dust as holmium with Moses technology, though this was an in vitro study. So the limitations of in vitro studies are being like when a company say, tells that this mobile uh, works on a single charging for this much uh, hours. So this actually is under all the ideal conditions. But in real life, we never get that much battery backup. So whatever the in vitro studies that are proved, we need to check them in real life. And that is why we try to do a retrospective analysis of in vivo, uh, in, in vivo settings of what happens with the, if we compare Moses technology versus Thulium. And then we conclude that uh, the, the, uh, the stone fragmentation distribution in both of them were almost comparable. They had comparable dusting and it probably reduced retropulsion. Mini PCNL uh, dusting with suction may achieve maximum stone clearance. That is why we aimed at uh, dusting of the stone. Addition of the stone uh, stabilizes the stone and leads to clear vision, which decreases the operative time and also the complications. Though uh, uh, in Thulium, we would make a note that uh, in some of the cases, we found a spark, uh, uh, but though we don't know what is the clinical implication of it. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. Um, sir, Kushin. can I ask one question, sir? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, actually, the aim, uh, if, if you, if you use a large stone, for example, 2.5 centimeter, if you aim from beginning the dust, will it not take a little longer time? Like, I, I'm, I'm just uh, getting the doubt. Because purposefully, we make fragments sometimes. Yeah. No, no. But uh, our aim here is to find out the dusting, which is the best energy. Time was not a, a criteria because important was if the, if you dust the stone, you can suck out completely. You can have a hundred percent clearance. If you have a fragmentation and it can it can go anywhere and um, it may not. So the, our aim was such Thank that you. dusting is the important. So, Thank you. So what is your comment on this compared to study? Yes, yeah, a great. Uh, really appreciate it, sir. Okay, really Kushir. I, yeah, you can hear me. Yeah, okay. Uh, I want to congratulate you for doing this work. Uh, I liked your slide very much, Abhijit, on the battery power. Uh, that's a nice one, because you're right. The laboratory provides different data. I mean, we've done work with the Moses technology, and we found that we found Moses distance was better. Uh, Mike Lipkin uh, with Glenn's team and Duke found that Moses contact was better. And, you know, this is the problem with sometimes scientific studies that methodology can vary from one group to the other, different endpoints. So I see that, but more or less, they look comparable in terms of the dusting ability. So uh, what about, did you assess vision? Was that a difference? Was there any visual issues? I mean, I guess in the suction world, you're always sucking. So that's improving your vision. 
But have you noticed any issues around vision with, with the uh, RIRS? No, it, it, in PCNL with suction, the vision is beautiful. In RIRS, you can get into, you know, you have to wait and uh, clear. So, um, uh, but you know, we work, uh, we are trying to see, for example, uh, when we do combined flexible ultroscopy with PCNL, in a, um, uh, in a stone configuration. And that time when we do the flexible ultroscopy, we keep the suction on, on the PCNL. And we have a beautiful vision and we can get hold, you know, we pick up the stone and with the one puncture and then we can take the stones away from the other, other calyx. And so there the, we find that suction effect is much more, you know, which is a near study, you know, where, where the vision is absolutely clear. Emmy, you have any any comments on this? Emmy, you have a, any comments on this study? So I I actually love how you did this study. I think that um, it's necessary. We're lacking this data, clinical data, on on the comparison. We're we're just getting anecdotal information from different locations. So this is such an important study, and um, it. it it confirmed my suspicions that they are very similar. Um, so I, I, I congratulate you on the study. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Glenn? Yes, Mahesh, again, as, as uh, Amy and Kershid also just mentioned, having th these in vivo results really prove that the, uh, some of the hype uh, if you will, of one of the lasers over the other is maybe not as justified in that with the proper settings, you can get very similar results in, in the real world situation. Okay, Glenn, now Shashank is going to present the, um, uh, your paper. Uh, Shashank? As it is rightly said, Innovation is where the imagination meets ambition. And we have quite seen the superior results when the suction was attached to the conventional PCNL. So the question is that, why the RRS should lag behind in the race? So we performed first human experience at our center that is multibipotelurological hospital and year and a half back under the guidance of two legions that is Dr. Mahesh Deshai and Dr. Glenn Premanga. So 70 patients planned for flexible retroscopy with laser lithotripsy for renal calculus between 5 to 15 millimeter or multiple renal scoot stones as long as the size of the largest stone is below the 15 millimeter were prospectively randomized into two groups. In group one, basket was used for stone fragment uh, for stone extraction after the laser lithotripsy, and in group two which includes the CVAC device in which nine patients were enrolled in which after laser lithotripsy, this CVAC device was introduced for the aspiration of the stone fragments. And the patients with febrile UTI during diastasis or anatomical anomalies like in the form of horseshoe kidney or PUJ were excluded from the study. Now coming to the results, while analyzing the preoperative param parameters like the patient demographic profiles in the form of age, sex ratio, and BMI, which were both comparable in both the arms, and as far as the stone parameters like the stone multiplicity or the stone volume or the stone density are concerned, these parameters were also comparable in both the basket and CVAC arm. Intraoperative parameters, we found that the mean fluoroscopic time and the mean procedure time was more in the CVAC arm. However, it came out to be statistically non-significant. On post-operative parameters, we found that the mean volume of the stone removed and the mean percentage volume of the stone removed was more in the CVAC arm and was statistically significant. Rest of the parameters like hemoglobin drop, the hospital stay, and the complications were comparable in both the arms. 77% patients in the CVAC arm achieved complete stone clearance on post-operative day two itself, which was confirmed with the plain CT KUB as against the 50% patients who achieved stone clearance in the basket arm on day two. And in contrary to this, 100% patients who were randomized in the CVAC arm achieved 100% total stone clearance at the one month of follow, which was confirmed with the plain CT KOB as against 75% patients in the basket arm. So to conclude, the safety profile of the CVAC device was acceptable and it demonstrated more efficient stone removal. And the, stu uh, and the use of the CVAC device demonstrated a superior stone free rate compared to the conventional basketing after the retroscopic lithotripsy. Thank you.
So, <clears throat> Glenn, this was uh, the paper. Um, uh, and we are looking forward to um, have this. The one question is there, is there most effective suction technique for RIRS beside this? Well, uh, first, uh, I think Naveen did a beautiful job presenting that, and uh, and Shawshank uh, really did the majority of the work uh, behind the scenes on this particular study, and so we thank him for that. I, I think the real questions that we were asking ourselves before we did our first clinical trial was um, uh, was the um, you know, how well did the suction work? Were we, were we able to get to all the parts of the collecting system? Were we going to have problems with clogging? And uh, what about the safety? And I think that Naveen showed that uh, we answered all those questions, at least in this initial clinical trial, that it, uh, we can navigate throughout the system using fluoroscopy alone and that the uh, amount of fluoroscopy or the additional fluoroscopy time was negligent. It really didn't um, pose a risk. Uh, we didn't see problems with uh, clogging, nor did we see significant trauma to the collecting system. And ultimately, uh, this device provided um, very efficient stone removal. Um, interestingly, there are, uh, I believe, a couple other uh, companies that are working on similar devices. Um, both, uh, uh, both are flexible. Uh, uh, however, I don't think they've, um, they have the device uh, finalized yet. I do believe that um, using the information that we learned today about Moses settings and the Thulium laser to better fragment the stone will make this technique even better. Because obviously, if we can get all the stone to uh, two millimeters or less in size, then we should be able to suck it all out using a device like the CVAC um, to uh, clear the system. And I think all of us, when we do flexible ureteroscopy, whether we're using the Thulium or the Homium laser, um, we see the sand uh, flying around the system. We see it uh, uh, piling up in the lower pole and we always say, boy, I wish I could get all that sand out. And I think now we have a technology that allows us to do that. Glenn, that time we discussed uh, when we are doing the, the suction uh, under the fluoroscopic guidance, whether we can have a telescope at the tip of the suction so we can uh, go to each calyx and then visualize and take it out. So any progress on that? So, um, uh, I don't know uh, the, the other technologies, whether they're going to have visual guidance to look into all the calyces. Um, but uh, again, the, the issue with that is it may significantly increase the price um, uh, and the complexity of developing that. Uh, and so um, uh, I think that our early results suggest that fluoroscopic guidance alone is adequate. Okay. What do you think of... Um the, the Aureus, the Mihir presented that um, the uh, percutaneous um, device to... Well, the, I think the beautiful thing of Mihir's presentation is that it showed um, how nicely it held the stone in position. Now, he did comment that depending on the configuration um, or the shape of the stone, uh, that could change. Uh, but um, uh, since it's a larger suction device, you get even larger fragments and probably it's even more efficient. It can be done more quickly. So uh, again, another, another way uh, of, of uh, introducing suction during flexible ureteroscopy, uh, maybe a bit more invasive than flexible ureteroscopy alone, but definitely an alternative for perhaps for larger stone volume. I thought that you know having a percutaneous uh, a tube would definitely decrease the intrarenal pressure, because what I saw um, during the PCNL that um, uh, the patient did not have a pain, and um, when I did ultrasound um, next day, I could see the white fat very clearly. There was no edema outside, and that's why the pain was less. Intra intra uh, uh, intravasation was less. So probably the pain would be less uh, if you have a suction in that, you know. 
one question has come uh, chandramohan sir uh, uh, in a mini park with thulium why increase the frequency instead of energy for obtaining obtaining dusting in a hard stone what is your setting for a hard stone uh, yes, do you sir, increase the frequency I... or do you increase the uh, power I, if I wanted to you see, it depends on my access sheet, sir. If I am using any less than twelve or fifteen, definitely I like to dust. In that case, I won't increase the uh, energy at all. So once you increase the energy to point two point by chance point three, immediately they will become pieces, and then chasing those pieces will be difficult. So point one and hundred hertz will nicely paint and all the. If I am using eighteen or twenty. particularly with or without suction or with the forceps then i deliberately go to point 2 uh, joules and 200 hertz then automatically it become multiple pieces and they will come out if or you can use the forceps okay so you know i i think you know personally i think this um, uh, the solution at the moment of uh, having a complete clearance lies in the energy and the suction whether we use a pcnl or we use a frequency and that's why we got all the modality together so i would like um, um our guest each one to say something about uh, uh, the final concept before we close so let's start uh, with uh, yeah please so thank you uh, i think we are uh, entering a new era of stone uh, management uh, exciting technologies we've seen development of advances in the homium platform the new thulium laser we've got robotic systems coming along we've got fantastic lithotripes for maxi pcnl and mini pcnl and now suction is going to be part of the armamentarium as you've shown us with the mini pcnl i think it's it's a uh, it's helping you achieve 100% stone clearance I used to think 100% stone clearance was fake. Uh, I never believed in 100% stone clearance, but I think it's something that we can achieve with with the advances that you've shown here. And I really feel suction is an important aspect, not just post procedure like what Dr. Preminger has shown us with the CVAC device, but also during the procedure for in, improving the vision. uh in keeping the stone closer to the uh, energy modality whether that's you know, lithotripe based or laser lithotripsy trait base and reducing the pressure intrarenal pressure and then also reducing heat generation when it comes to high power lasers and high power lasers are there both for homium and thulium because it looks like the energy settings are high in both so i th- i think i think this is a really exciting time in the next few years we're going to see more and more new technologies in this space and i'm really i'm really looking forward to seeing because at the end of the day the aim is to improve the outcomes for our patients thank you um gland he's muted you you are on mute up to preminger you're on mute sorry thank you um i uh, uh, thank you uh, mahesh and, and i agree 100% with kurshid that um Uh, that when you're talking about uh, minimally invasive modalities to remove the stone, whether it's mini perk or flexible ureteroscopy, it, it's all about the uh, efficacy of stone fragmentation and the efficiency of stone removal. Uh, and that um, what we've seen this this evening uh, is the combination of either. Um, different uh, settings of the thulium or the homium laser combined with suction whether again you're doing this percutaneously or you're ureteroscopically that suction is going to allow for the uh, efficient stone removal uh, and i too um, when we saw the original results of the trial from nadiad with the uh, cvac device and it was 100% i said we can't show these results 100% no one gets 100% stone free rate um uh, however i think that um now with um aggressive or a- active suction whether it's uh, combined in the trilogy or whether it's uh, through a, a clear petri sheath or the cvac device i think that having active suction that you can navigate the system 
uh, can bring you as close to 100% um, as possible. Thank you, thank you. Amy, um, uh, we also, we didn't show, but in a one case, Stegon calculus, we use the trilogy on one side, and from the upper pole, we use um, um, the Moses, and we compared that, you know. Um, so we find that the trilogy also makes a dust, and the dust is, you know, sucked out in it's quite a bit. So mm -hmm. I think the suction, which, do, you, do you change the power of suction time to time when you are? So occasionally I will change the suction, but almost always it works quite well at 50%. Um, with the gravity inflow. Um, I, I have to say that this has been a phenomenal presentation. I actually have a full page of notes. It's been in innovative. I've learned uh, a lot, even though I sit through a lot of these and I you really should be commended. Um, I think that you're on the right track because simply breaking up a stone and leaving the fragments, in my opinion, is the absolute worst thing you can do for a patient. Because if you want to grow crystals, you make more surface area. Um, and that's what we're doing when we just dust and we don't remove the fragments. So incorporating the suction is paramount to get these patients stone free and to prevent the recurrence. And I, I'm really excited about um, the technology that Dr. Priminger showed. Um, I've used Clear Petra before. I think I've been saying that it's, the, it's phenomenal for a long time and I, I'm really excited about this work, so. Thank you, thank you, Amy. Chandra Mohan? Uh, sir, I agree. Would you I, would you would you include the section now? Yes, sir, doing no, quite sir. a bit of thulium. Yes, sir, definitely because when we think that uh, we have done best job, still if you do CT scan, small amounts of fragments always remain. It was never eighty five percent more than uh, even though we have done on table very well, but this uh, migration into other calices and small uh, particles moving here can be avoided. Quite innovative, sir. I did not know this much detail. Uh, today, I'm really benefited among uh, all the speakers, to be honest. Actually, Dr. Sabnis has um, done the comparison between the shock pulse and the trilogy. And, um, but what we thought that um, uh, we should, uh, in that study, we thought we should keep the stone, uh, or the location of the stone uh, to be same. Sabnis, what was, is it? Yeah, I think we did a study and actually in the, those cases, we uh, did not use the conventional PCNL, but we compared shock pulse and the trilogy uh, with the mini PCNL. And what we found is that both energies are quite superior. They are almost the same, uh, not much difference. And therefore, uh, after comparing and after studying these uh, various stones with this uh, breaking devices, what I feel is that the future is going to be on the suction. And there are two ways, as we discuss in this uh, whole session, that suction, whether it is on the sheath or whether it is on the probe. And if we are going to use the mini perk, and if we are going to talk about the mini PCNL, then the uh, suction on the probe uh, probably may score over the suction on the sheath. Because uh, the way the trilogy or the shock pulse is fragmenting the stone, making the powder and immediately with the powerful suction, uh, sucking it out is actually uh, uh, far more beneficial. And trilogy or the shock pulse will score over the laser because basically these are the energy sources uh, which have much, much more uh, powerful than the uh, any amount of laser or any power laser if you take into consideration. So that's my uh, frank opinion. Well, you know, taking his point, we have already started um, a prospective study comparing the, uh, the trilogy, uh, shock pulse on one hand and the laser on the other hand. And then uh, we'll be looking at, um, again, we're looking at the dust and the power of suction. That will be the thing. I would like to... One, 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 one final uh, point I wanted to make also is that as suction becomes more uh, uh, the... Uh, integral to stone clearance, the physics and technologies that uh, underlie irrigation suction systems are going to be very critical. It's not just a matter of connecting a suction to the end of a tube. That doesn't work. Uh, I think there is, it's a very sophisticated physics of fluid going in, 
maintaining visualization, avoiding decompression, avoiding over inflation. And I think pressure sensing and, and, and automated technologies that allow for that uh, uh, is going to be uh, another opportunity for technology improvement, uh, focusing away from the scope and the, the actual uh, lithotripsy devices. I think that suction physics is going to be uh, uh, crucial. Mir, uh, what about the, the robotic flexible erotroscopy? Because uh, we find when we do the flexible erotroscopy with laser, you know, the movement um, on the stone uh, requires it to be very, very steady. And uh, sometimes the hand movement, you know, you can uh, move the fibers much more and can have a little injury. So uh, uh, is there any progress on the uh, uh, robotic flexible erotroscope? No, I mean, theoretically, uh, a robotic platform should allow you to scale down motion and give you finer control. But obviously, the because of respiration and etc., it always doesn't translate clinically. So uh, I'm not convinced co completely that just for uretroscopy, uh, roboticizing that catheter is going to give you a substantial clinical benefit. But if you marry everything with the whole process of the possibility of perk access, the possibility of combined hybrid procedures, et cetera, then I think the value gets added on much more. But just for eritroscopy, it, it seems that robotics should give you, you know, finer scaled motion, but it doesn't always translate clinically because there are other extraneous factors that influence that, that part. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to thank all the speakers, um, uh, the guest speakers for taking part. Um, um, and it is it is already time was overshooted, but uh, it was very absorbing and we learned quite a bit. And I'm also very thankful to my MPH team. The boys, they have worked very hard and they were presented very well. And uh, uh, I'm thankful to uh, uh, all of you. Uh, just for your information, there were uh, 382 um, people logged in for our uh, um, uh, webinar. So that's um, the good number. And um, we thank, again, this will be available on the YouTube. Um, people who have not been able to um, uh, listen to it or join now, they can always go back and join it and then they can see it. That'll be- and this, is, this is in spite of, there are six seminars uh, going on simultaneously as simultaneously. of just now. So, right. so 380 people uh, logging in and watching is certainly, uh, I think right. the credit goes to all the guest speakers uh, speaker, who have right. attracted yeah. the speakers. Chandra Mohan, you want to say anything? Uh, nothing, sir. Very good, sir. Very Thank good. You. And uh, we learned a lot. All right. Thank okay. you.